This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening. We have two meetings this evening. Uh, I want to ask people to mute so that there's no echo. Thank you. Uh, we have two meetings this evening. The first one is a public forum on the CPA recommendations, but not including the library. The second is our regular town council meeting. So I'm going to start by calling meeting to order. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold a town council meeting. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the March 22nd, 2021 public forum to order at 631. I will call upon each counselor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear me and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. And so I'm going to start. Um, I don't see Shalini, so I'm going to start with Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy DeMont. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Still waiting. Okay. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Sarah Schwartz. Present. Okay. Uh, we're going to begin with a very, very brief presentation on this. It'll be a slide. It will show the recommendations of the Community Preservation Act Committee. And I also want to note that with us in the audience this evening is Sarah Marshall, who is chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee. And also note that with us in uh, as a panelist is Anthony Delaney, who is the major staff supporting um, that group as well. So very quickly, could you show the slide that shows the, the recommendations? So this is the fiscal order that shows the recommendations. And I just want to point out very quickly that each of the recommendations is shown by the amount of money and they are in various uh, groupings. The first one is housing. The second grouping is historic preservation. The third grouping is open space, but there are no projects in open space this year. The fourth is total recreation. And the fifth is administrative. And then in addition to that, um, we also make sure that there is uh, a reserve and a historical reserve. So we're going to take that down. I'm going to ask the audience to raise your hand if you have comments with regard to the um, Community Preservation Act recommendations. Uh, Chris Brestrup, would you like to make a comment? Um, can you show the slide again um, about the CPA um, monies? I, I guess I was mistaken about the North Common. I thought there were two amounts for $250,000 each, one for historic uh, preservation and one for um, recreation. Anthony, do you want to clarify that? Uh, that is that is what's there. There's a there's a line. I think it would be line six there. Yep, where the mouse is. And then yes, yeah, so it's the same project split into two different fields, two different I functional see. areas. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll leave it up for a little bit. But meantime, uh, are there any questions or comments from the audience?
This is the public comment period. Uh, this comes to the council for a vote later on. We are not voting on the recommendation with regard to the library. That's the Jones Library. Are there any other questions from the staff or councilors? Okay, uh, Kathy. Hey, um, Lynn, I have a comment more than a question just for the audience that this, we earlier this year voted on the Belchertown Road purchase. So there, we have actually, CPAC has allocated more to community housing than is shown here, but that was taken because we had an immediate need to close down a purchase order. So it, it was done off the normal cycle. So it's just, it's just for completion. Um, right. Thank you. It's not on this purchase order because we've already done that. Are there comments or questions from the audience? Yes, Bruce Colton. Please enter the room, state your name, unmute, state your name, where you will live, and your question. Uh, Bruce Colton. Um, I live at 159 Pine Street in Amherst. Uh, my question is just looking at the, uh, the, the list of projects here, I noticed that almost all of them are town related which seems to be a change from the um, previous years where I was more involved and interested because of the North Amherst Community Farm. I was uh, paying attention to this uh, over the past five or six years. Is that true or is this just a section of the, uh, of the total um, allocations? Um, there's actually two allocations that are not on here. One was mentioned earlier by Councilor Shane and that's the allocation that we did to purchase um, the, ro the property on Belchertown Road for low-income housing. The other one that's not on here is a million dollars for the Jones Library Historic Preservation. That will come up before the council in April. So, so I guess then we are looking at the CPA allocations, which is substantially uh, town-generated uh, town projects. Is this a trend? Or uh, is this an aberration, do you think? It's, uh, I don't think it's either. I think it's uh, what came up this year. Uh, the town is considered to be a um, respectable applicant for community preservation. Oh, um, yes, yes, I'm sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply otherwise. I'm just curious as to why there seems to be so few uh, community uh, nonprofits that are, have been apparently motivated to apply. Um, Athena, I'm going to ask if you would bring Sarah Marshall into the room if she'd like to comment on that. Or maybe Anthony Delaney would like to comment. Uh, so it is uh, it is true that the town makes up the majority of the proposals accepted this year. Uh, only one proposal was proposed and not accepted this year. It was a private uh initiative that was in its initial configuration ruled not eligible for cpa um the cpa has some uh ideas about outreach and we'll be making some efforts towards that this summer um greater advertising some info sessions uh, other ideas under consideration so committee has the, the committee has noticed that too um uh, I, I, I would, I would, if Sarah has something else to say there, I would definitely want to hear from her. You could bring Sarah into the room. Sarah is, as I mentioned earlier, is the chair of the CPA committee. Am I in the room? You are. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, Bruce, I don't know, uh, but my guess is the pandemic may have just um, 
slowed down the work of a lot of private organizations. That's just a guess. Thank you very much, all of you. That's uh, helpful. I'll, I'll go. Ahead. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks for joining us. Are there any other comments from uh, the audience at this time? Questions are also welcomed. Yes, Janet Keller, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Sure, Janet Keller, and I live um, on Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst. Um, I just came in, I apologize. Are we only talking about Community Preservation Act things? We are, this is the public forum, Community okay. Preservation Act only. Okay, I'll go away, thanks. Thanks. Are there any other comments about the Community Preservation Act um, recommendations from the CPA committee? Jen, you need to lower your hand, please. Thank you. Are there any other comments? I'm going to remain for about another two or three minutes and then we're going to move to the regular council meeting. Okay. Any other comments from the audience? Gabriella, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Uh, can you hear me now? We can, and these are comments only on the Community Preservation Act. Okay, uh, so I have a question about the Gabriella Horvath. Uh, I live in Amherst um, at Greenleaves, and uh, I have a question about the North Common Project. I confess I have not been following this project at all, so I'm maybe asking a question or making a comment, which has already been covered at previous times. So is the North Common Project, is that the one that is going to be removing parking spaces and putting a band shell up in the common? It is the one that we are going to be discussing later on the agenda tonight, and there's actually dedicated public comment for it. Uh, it actually, there's two proposals on the table. One is a partial removal of parking. The other one removes all of the parking on the common. It is not where there is a proposed band shell. That would be on the south common. Okay, but there will be a you will be addressing that later on in the meeting. Yes, we will. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments on the CPA recommendations at this time? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to ask that we take the um, slide down and I'm going to just pause for one more moment. And I'm going to at this point adjourn this public forum and we're going to move immediately into the town council meeting at 645. Okay. I've already talked about Governor Baker's provisions. This is now the regular town council meeting. I'm calling it to order at 645. Two additional counselors have joined us. I want to make sure that they can hear us and we can hear them. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Thank you. Dorothy Pam. Please unmute and let us know if you can hear us and we can hear you. Okay, I'm going to come back to Dorothy in a moment. 
Okay. Um, this meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. There's no chat room. If anybody has technical issues, please let Athena and myself know, and we can decide at that time what to do with the meeting. Um, I also want to draw attention to the announcements on the printed agenda. I'm not going to go through those announcements, but I do want to highlight that there are two public forums on the Promway Village intersection. One is this Thursday night at six, and one is on Saturday, March 7th. Dorothy, I see that you're here. Can you yes. hear us and we can hear you? Right. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, and let me just mention, we have one event outside Town Hall. It is an event with flag raising. It's a ceremony uh, along with a proclamation regarding Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. And that is on April 6th at 9 a.m. in front of Town Hall. You can take that down. We have no hearings this evening, so we're going to mo move to public comment. While there may be an opportunity, while there will be an opportunity for public comment on the North Common later in the agenda, this is the only other public comment this evening. I'm going to ask for a show of hands of all the people who would like to comment. Okay, um, resident, residents are welcome to express their views, I'm going to say for up to two minutes at the discretion of the council president. Based on the number that I'm seeing, I'm going to keep it to two minutes. The council will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. So I'll begin by asking Michelle Miller to enter the room and state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Michelle Miller in North Amherst. Good evening, counselors. I'm here tonight on behalf of Reparations for Amherst to comment on Mr. Bockelman's memo 7C, update on funds appropriated to address systemic racism. First, we wanna commend the Community Safety Working Group for their deeply transformative work on behalf of our community. We congratulate Seven Generations Movement Collective for winning the bid and are confident they will do exceptional work to support the group. We're also very happy to see Mr. Balkman's thoughtful consideration with respect to the remainder of the funds available to address systemic racism. We wholeheartedly support the work of the core equity team, Proposal 1, and the data collection, Proposal 3 and do not wish to compete with either of those initiatives for funding. And we firmly believe both of those things should be incorporated as line items into the regular operating budget and be considered ongoing work of the town. If we are to become a truly anti-racist community, we will need to be addressing equity and collecting data regularly. Our municipal budget is a direct reflection of our values as a community and must therefore include addressing the town's systemic racist practices and collecting racial data in the regular planning of our budget. Our request is a one-time ask specific to time-related items and if approved, will be directly used to support the town's commitment to engage in a path of remedy for black residents. Specifically, the, fun the funds will be used to compensate Black folks for engaging in our research work and facilitating educational opportunities for our community. The Town Council support of this request will have benefits for all. At this very moment, counselors in Evanston are getting ready to vote on the first iteration of their reparations bill. If the vote passes, they will become the first U.S. city to offer reparations money to Black residents ever. We could be the second but we need your support to help us advance. Thank you. 
for your comment, Michelle. Alex Kent, please enter the room, state your name and where you live, and please, to the extent possible, keep your comments to two minutes. Thank you, counselors. I'm Alex Kent, 83 North Prospect Street. Naomi Klein has written, limits are a problem for our economic system. Ours is a culture of endless taking as if there were no end and no consequences, a culture of grabbing and going. This attitude is manifest in buildings like 1 East Pleasant Street, a building that is vastly out of scale compared to the rest of the downtown business district. Its walls run sheer from the sidewalk line to the top of its barely articulated, no setback, five-story facades. Rents are sky high from $1,660 for a studio to $3,100 for a two bedroom. Like other archipelago projects downtown, the building offers zero affordable housing and probably never will. As a 20 year downtown resident, I support development of the business district and downtown neighborhoods. I would support zoning that permits even encourages greater density, but only if that development includes owner occupied rentals multi-unit owner-occupied condominiums and preferably in-town co-housing. I want zoning that actively discourages the construction of absentee landlord student housing. I strongly support the proposed permitting moratorium. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Alex. Ira Brick, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Ira Brick. I live at 255 Strong Street. And I just want to support the idea of taking a break, uh, a moratorium, to do more planning, more public input, um, more seriously considering a lot of the objections from a lot of people in our community that we are not building the right things. Um, nobody wants those five-story buildings, and it looks like there's no end in sight to them. Uh, nobody uh, who's complaining on these calls, at least, wants the densification to the point that you're creating overcrowding that is more slum-like than anything else. Everybody wants to live in a nice neighborhood, no matter how diverse that neighborhood is. And I think that there's a lot of um, damage that can be done if you build now that's going to last for generations. We can take a pause and you will... Uh, be glad that you are building what the community wants, what's going to entice people to go downtown. And just one mismatch that just seems to be more apparent than ever is the number of student uh, apartments that are surrounding the new playground. Uh, who's gonna play there? It's, a, it's an attractive nuisance for college students. So I'm just saying, let's pause and do more planning and more public input. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments, Ira. Ruth Hazard, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ruth Hazard. I live on Pine Street in North Amherst. And uh, thank you for giving me a time to, to speak. I. I see that a decision about anti-racism training for the council is on your agenda this evening. I'd like to express my appreciation and my support for the anti-racism training that you are soon to embark on and urge you to fully engage with the training. I have also done various trainings from decades ago to days ago and uh, to learn about and to gain skills to undo the systemic racism that pervades our country. And I have learned something new and important from each one of them. As a person of European descent who has the privileges of whiteness, I have had to learn to see what was all around me and what I was conditioned by white supremacy culture to not see and to not understand. Often it is very painful to understand how this system has harmed black people, indigenous people, and other people of color over centuries, and how the system operates to keep itself going. It is not easy work, but I find that every time I see more clearly the truth 
of the harm and injustice that was and is still going on, I also gain in wholeness and integrity within myself. The work of white folks is not about becoming swamped and mired and lost in guilt and shame. Though the fear of that can sometimes stop me and us from moving deeper into the work. It is about lifting ourselves into wholeness, into being our highest selves, being grounded in our bodies and our hearts so that we can generously take responsibility for working to change what's wrong. I urge you to hold to the vision of a fully inclusive culture and structure in our town and beyond, one that empowers and enriches all of us. When I have taken the risk to keep moving toward that goal, I have never regretted it. When I have invested time and energy into that work, I've grown stronger accordingly. It was worth the investment. And so I offer you my support and respect as you move forward into that vision. Thank you. Ruth, thank you for your comments. Mary Sayer, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, Mary Sayre, Pine Street. Um, and I thank Ruth for that. That was, anyway, I, th I thank her for saying what she said. Um, I'm calling about the moratorium and I would, um, and I'm in favor of it because what I've heard from the town council and I've tried to follow the, the planning board on this, um, that we have a housing crisis, but I haven't heard any even approximate figures on how many people in town rent, how many people own, how many people would like to move, where they would like to move to, what size they would like to move into, are they downsizing? Um, so I think that we need to get that kind of information before we start simply building. Amherst actually in the past, in the 70s, overbuilt. And I think it was the kind of place we're in right now where we just said, we need housing to build. And I think that we need to do it in a considered way. So I am for this moratorium simply. I think we should send a survey to uh, the town via our census and it can be anonymous, just asking people, telling them why we wanna know their opinion and then asking simple questions. Are you planning on moving? Would you like to move? If you would like to move but can't move, why not? Where would you like to move to? There are so many pieces of information that I don't think the town has because I've asked and I haven't gotten any sort of hard figures. So I would like to get beyond a, a feeling that we have a housing crisis to, we have a housing crisis and, here, and here's what it represents. Um, quickly, I know at North Square, all the affordable housing went very fast and the rest is primarily students and graduate students. So I think we need to look at what's already built and who's in it and then go from there. Thank you. Mary, thank you for your comments. Kitty Axels and Barry, please enter the room, state your name, where you live. Hi, um, Kitty Axels and Barry. I live on Stony Hill Road in Echo Hill South. And I'm just wondering really what your vision for Amherst is, especially in light of COVID and affordability and um, the lack of projections about how the student population is going to increase or decrease. Um, I don't think we really have any idea whether we're gonna need an urban corridor or even be able to use an urban corridor of tall apartment style student dorms. Um, that many people think are pretty ugly um, and overshadow, overshadow everything else. So I'm wondering if what you really want is a healthy, robust, sustainable mix of ages, mix of shades and colors and genders, um, young families, middle-aged, older people, local, small local businesses. I used to be able to get everything I needed downtown when I first moved here in 1971. Now, I really can't get 
a head of lettuce, unless it's the summertime and then, you know, I can go to the farmer's market. Um, but you just can't really get any groceries other than maybe CVS if you want to support CVS. Um, I can't get a hammer. I, I really, I can't get a pair of socks unless they say Amherst College. Um, and yes, I can go out to eat, but I want to be able to support my small businesses. I want to be able to get what I need downtown and to walk there um, once I get to the downtown area. Taking by taking a bus is what I want to be able to do. So I'm my basic question is what's your vision for Amherst and is densification throughout um, the area that goes all the way from about Southeast Street all the way to sun, beyond Sunset Avenue. It goes at, way out to Route 9. It goes over to Pokeberry Ridge. Is, is making a lot of um, putting, is increasing the density so much really the way to accomplish whatever your vision is. And I don't know what it is anymore. That's all. Thank you, Kitty. Mm -hmm. Su Suzanne Fabing, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, uh, I'm Susanna Fabing Muspratt. I live at 38 North Prospect Street and I'd like to speak in favor of the proposed moratorium. A lot of issues are in the air at present that should be resolved before any more new buildings are approved. Inclusionary zoning, downtown parking, how to attract year round residents, families, workers and retirees to live in or near downtown, how to sustain the small businesses that locals depend on, how to make our town a magnet for visitors and enhance its economic vitality. In short, to address some of the other objectives of the master plan for town center beyond housing. There's even simply been a need to define a mixed use building and an apartment building, which hasn't been properly done heretofore. The planning department has been working on many of these questions and studying several of the zoning amendments that council wants to consider, but those efforts are still very much in process. They've recently decided to hire a consultant to facilitate discussion with residents and other stakeholders, that's a great step, and to make recommendations about design guidelines and zoning changes. The consultant won't begin work until June, however. Meanwhile, developers are rushing to get their downtown projects approved, lest any changes might be adopted that are not in their favor. Since all of these issues are actively in play, it makes no sense to approve building permits for new residential buildings in our precious but very small downtown and the surrounding RG before the consultants and planners have done their work and town council has been able to chart a course forward. A moratorium now will permit a reasoned and considered planning process for making the crucial decisions that will determine the town's future. Without a moratorium, more bricks and mortar will be put in place that the town will regret for decades to come and opportunities for positive improvements in our built environment will have passed us by. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Suzanne. Susan Cummings, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm Susan Cummings at 27 Greenleaves Drive. Um, I request the proposed moratorium um, on the construction permits for residential buildings be extended to Route 9 and University Place, where in recent months there has been a dizzying amount of residential construction, primarily for college students. Adding to these build, new buildings is yet another one currently under construction at uh, the corner of Route 9 and Snell. Um, the impact on traffic, crowding, and the character of this area of town is staggering. Um, I also would request the council to extend the proposed moratorium. It is uh, to more than six months to at least nine months until after the town elections in November so that candidates and citizens can discuss what they all want for Amherst. And I just heard about this consultant, which sounds like a great idea. 
So thank you very much. Oh, if I may, do I have time? Yes. Okay. I would like to say, uh, looking at the future, I would ask that if it is determined by the town and UMass that even more student housing is necessary, the council seriously explore with UMass the alternative of joint public-private housing projects on the UMass campus, which has been the idea of which has been thrown around for years, and I I don't know I there was press about it you know I don't know a year or so ago, and I. I don't know why it's not being considered. Sounds like a great idea. Thank you very much. Susan, thank you for your comments. Pat Rooney, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Pam Rooney, thank you for having me. I'm sorry, Pat, Pam. It's okay, no, my, my grandmother called that too. <laughs> uh, I do support uh, forwarding this article to the planning board for the process by which the community can weigh in and discuss uh, a moratorium on, on what's coming down the pike at us. Uh, I have been advocating for some time that we plan first and, and then change our zoning and adjust our bylaws second. So I, I am heartily in favor of moving this along so that we have some good discussion about, yes, let's build more in the, in the town center but let's please do it in a way that we can live with for the next generation or two. So thank you, let's move it along and into the hands of the planning board with some good public process. Thank you. Pam, thank you for your comments. So again, my apologies for misstating your name. Uh, Jane Pearl, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Jane Pearl. I live in Echo Hill on Duxbury Lane. Uh, for almost 30 years. Um, I have a question about the definition of affordable housing. I haven't seen in any town documents, the town, um, uh, uh, what, what that means in dollars and cents. So I, I looked it up and there's a simple formula, uh, which uh, low income is defined as 50 to 60% of the area's median family income uh, for a family of four. And, um, and so if we assume 60% to be, you know, magnanimous, <laughs> uh, to err on the side of uh, the higher number, and assume that 30% of uh, one's budget should uh, be devoted to housing, then it, and the, um, it seems like, uh, oh, and the median family income for a family of four in 2019 was $56,658. The 60% of that is uh, almost $34,000. And 30% of that um, is uh, divided by 12 is less than $900 for a family of four. That would be rent, affordable rent. That's, I may be incorrect, but that's the number I came up with. And I, uh, there's another formula that I, I came up with for affordable, uh, home ownership, but I think we're talking about rental more for the, the coming buildings that are being discussed. And so I would very much like clarification about what that town considers an affordable rent for a family of four, maybe also for families of two or one or three. And, um, and if that is, if the rents, if the percentage of units that will be, con that would be devoted for affordable housing will include rents that low. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments, Jane. Janet Keller, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Janet Keller, 20, um, 120 Pulpit Hill Road, North Amherst. Um, I too um, am supporting um, the, a temporary moratorium. And I <clears throat> want to talk about the time it would allow the consultant to create design guidelines for how more housing can be built and then combined with small commercial commercial spaces affordable and very and is there a problem range of tenants and support a year-round economy it would address the problem that restaurants and other small businesses are now facing during the months of school break 
when their patronage drops by as much um, to 20% of normal, um, while uh, overhead remains at 100%. New guidelines would create an environment where local owners can afford to operate small shops, restaurants, and services that cater to visitors and year-round residents. Thorns Market in um, place in Northampton shows how a collection of small and even micro bus businesses can draw customers and enliven a town center. Providing buildings with spaces to accommodate a range of residents and businesses is not necessity for a year-round um, local economy. Many community members have spoken in recent months about the need for this type of development downtown and near downtown, and the master plan repeatedly calls for design guidelines. Good guidelines will build community support for new developments and draw people downtown. I hope you adopt this important proposal to plan first for, out, for an outstanding town center um, along some outstanding design guidelines, and then, and only then, incorporate them into any zoning changes. Thank you. Janet, thank you for your comments. Sandy Must Pratt, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. We need to unmute. Dean, is there a problem? Thank you. There you All go. Right. Uh, Sandy Muspratt, 38 North Prospect Street. I've looked over the town plan of 2010, and there are many laudable objectives, including, true, some for regarding housing, but not just a numerical count, preserving the character of the town and so on. And as I understand it, there has been a, uh, in recent years, last two or three years, a quite respectable number of permits met and buildings made. And that is continuing under the current zoning laws. Is an, an, why is there a necessity of change, changing it? What experience we've had of that building has not been encouraging. As many people have noted, largely students, not the desirable diverse uh, uh, population that we would like to see, and certainly not uh, affordable um, uh, units other than those required by law or zoning. Uh, so rich students can afford the small uh, place, place, places, but families of modest means cannot, and there's not enough room for them even if they could, uh, could afford it. So I want to know why there is a formulation of a housing crisis. I would like that to be explained. And those who put it forward should put those numbers out there to explain why there is a crisis. I think there should be a moratorium. I like the idea of extending it to the time of the coming election. So indeed, extend it to nine months. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Sandy. There's caller with the last four digits of 5700. Would you please come in, enter the room and state your name? Are there special instructions we need to give them, Athena? Ah, oh, looks like we're ready to go. Right ahead, please. Hi. Yes, my name is Jeff Cobb from Six Wildwood Lane. Thank you for uh, hearing me. I, I dialed in on a conference call, not Zoom, hence the strange uh, introduction. That's fine. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, echo my support for a temporary permit moratorium until such time that some of the zoning rules and uh, bylaws that uh, are currently being looked at can can be reviewed uh, with the with the aim of having uh, you know the right type of development that residents want in the areas that that they live. Um, I'd also like to see uh, a better consideration of owner occup occupancy for supplement supplementary units 
and also a dialogue with the university about the, the growing issue of student housing. Um, you know, I've participated in a number of planning board uh, discussions and zoning board of appeal discussions, and there's no, uh, there's, and town meeting discussions, and there's no, there's no uh, interaction with the, uni with the university, or there's no, I hear nothing from the university's input on this, and I think I would support a temporary uh, moratorium, and I would encourage the council and the appropriate town officials to really encourage the university to use their, their vast acreage to uh, address the student housing uh, problem in Amherst. Thank you for your, uh, listening to my comments. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Uh, Claudia Pasmani, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Because I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Claudia Pasmani here representing the Amherst Area Chamber uh, as the executive director and I'm offering a brief statement regarding the proposed building moratorium that um, we feel is detrimental to local economic growth and this is accompanied by a much fuller and complete statement that has submitted been submitted in full to the town council. Um, so as stated article 16 temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units as proposed would be detrimental to economic growth in the town of Amherst and send the wrong message. Amidst the economic and ongoing housing crisis our town and region are facing, the chamber has worked hard to position the Amherst area to merge, emerge more resilient and poised to be an economic engine of the region. Redevelopment and housing production are an important part of the recovery and our long-term economic development goals as a town. This moratorium will directly hurt builders, tradespeople, is fiscally irresponsible for the town and sends a clear message to those who are considering moving to starting their business in or investing in Amherst, do not do so. So we do want to highlight it. It's antithetical to the town's own studies and stated goals. And it's been as uh, stated as such at length by the Amherst Mun Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, the planning department and town council. Um, the demand for housing in Amherst greatly exceeds the supply. The move, move is also in direct contradiction with three of your stated F20, FY21's town council performance goals for the town manager, including economic vitality, four major capital investments and housing affordability adopted by the town council in September. Ultimately, the chamber um, who has been working directly with the bid has been working to support and recruit new businesses, residents to move to Amherst as well as planning. And while rebuilding our tourism initiatives and securing funding for revitalization initiatives, actively securing funding for revitalization initiatives. I state that emphatically. <laughs> Uh, this moratorium works in direct conflict with those investments. Even together with the bid during the pandemic, we work to address the need for adaptable pivots for our small business owners. We work together to encourage a modified zoning process. As a direct result, in June and then again in November 2020, you, the town council, overwhelmingly passed zoning, Article 14, including some of that temporary outdoor dining, to encourage we are here to encourage and facilitate the reopening of existing businesses and the opening of new businesses to stimulate economic activity in the aftermath of the COVID-19 emergency. We applaud you for all the efforts there. Again, the proposed building moratorium acts in direct contradiction with these goals. And it really helps, it seems to undermine um, Amherst's short-term economic recovery from the pandemic. So we're really, imploring the town councilors and planning board members to unequivocally reject this policy. Please send the message that the Amherst is a place that welcomes housing and economic development and simultaneously continue working diligently on the important planning and zoning reforms introduced in January of this year. Thank you for your time and service to the town of Amherst. What do you think? Uh, Bob Tancredi, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, my, my name is Bob Tancredi. I live at 57 High Street in Amherst. Uh, and I, am, I would like to uh, reiterate that, um, uh, back up some of the folks that have already spoken about a moratorium on the building. I especially think um, that uh, given what we've seen so far, 
and the fact that elections are coming later this year, I think we need to digest what's happened um, to this point. Uh, many, many people I speak with are not happy with it. Uh, again, I'm just talking about friends and neighbors. Uh, and I think uh, before we continue to you know, pound nails and put in permanent solutions for temporary problems, we need to catch our breath and uh, review where we're going. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of vitalizing downtown um, and vital revitalizing um, uh, businesses in Amherst to spread this uh, tax burden to businesses and other uh, buildings, permanent business buildings. Uh, but as a homeowner, uh, the tax burden uh, continues to fall on people like me for everything we do. Um, again, a moratorium, definitely. Let's see where we are. Let's see if the people of Amherst are happy with what's happened so far, and they can more time to discuss, more time to hear from other people, uh, and then they can vote uh, their opinion. Uh, I would also like to mention the reason I'm on this call is somebody puts a flyer in my mailbox today, uh, something about footnote M, something uh, the planning board is reviewing uh, and they would like to remove, I guess, and what that allows, uh, I know I'm not going to do it justice, but it seems like it allows knockdowns, uh, houses, housing knockdowns in residential neighborhoods replaced with townhouses or, you know, apartment complexes, no matter who lives on either side of it or, or whatever. It just, um, it looks like a license, again, for knockdowns and building uh, apartments. It sounds like a recipe to demolish uh, neighborhoods near downtown Amherst. I can't imagine who came up with it. It makes no sense. Um, but again, that's, um, I just wanted to get that comment and I really appreciate uh, this time and thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments, Bob. I wanna to mention to all of you that are still interested in commenting that the council will not be voting tonight on the zoning bylaw. It'll be referred and it must go through the hearing process and the hearing will provide plenty of opportunity for additional resident comment. So um, it's not a decision tonight that um, your comments are impacting. Carol Pope, please enter the room, and state your name, where you live. Hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carol Pope, 119 High Street. Um, I would like to just strongly urge and echo many of the comments already tonight to um, support the temporary um, building moratorium. And I agree, it should be nine months, not six months. I think so many decisions are being made without people being fully apprised of what's going on. I know people should be listening to your discussions more, but for those who don't, uh, I think there should be some kind of surveys or some kind of public information so they could all have a chance to express their dismay perhaps, but anyway, their opinions about how this is all coming down. So I strongly urge that we have a nine month moratorium on this building projects and, um, and I hope there will be lots of time for public comment. I appreciate your saying that, Lynn. So we are encouraged, I hope, to keep making public comments um, to keep this, whatever happens now is gonna affect us for generations to come. And it's already happened in our town. I mean, there's so many buildings have been built that many people I know and myself included are very unhappy with. They do not give us vibrancy in our downtown. They don't bring any wonderful green space. They bring nothing to energize our town or make people wanna to come to our downtown. So I think at least having a brief nine month time where we can stop and make decisions and think about this would be a big help. Thank you all for your participation and your help. Carol, thank you for your comments. And Scarf, please state your name and where you live.
Hello, um, my name is Annie Scarf. I live at 151 Amity Street in the Marsh House condominiums. Um, just a, a personal note, we live in what was the Amherst uh, funeral home. Um, it's now been renovated and there are two condominiums in the old house, a hundred year old house, and then three uh, units have been added to it. So we're, we're five families living here. Um, and it's been wonderful. Um, we've been here 12 years. So I guess that's a one way of saying the kind of development that I hope we can focus on more than the buildings that have gone up in the last couple of years. Um, I, I can second just about everything I've heard, um, but, but the three points that stand out for me are that with all of those four or five story apartment houses going up, as I understand it, there haven't been affordable units um, there's no parking. And one thing I just don't understand is why are we solving the University of Massachusetts uh, student housing problem? Um, obviously, this is, this is a, a, a college town and there's a lot of benefits that go both ways. Um, but I, I don't understand why uh, essentially dorms are being built um, in downtown Amherst. Anyway, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and um, yeah, and have a good evening. Annie, thanks for your comment. Jennifer Taub, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Uh, Jennifer Taub, I live at 259 uh, Lincoln Avenue. Um, I actually wasn't going to speak tonight because I didn't want to just repeat all the comments for people speaking in support of the moratorium as I do. Um, but I just wanted to respond to the comment that was made from the spokesperson from the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, I think it was the Chamber of the Bid. Um, and I'm not clear how the moratorium sends the wrong message to the business community, since the new buildings downtown have only displaced numerous businesses. Um, it seems like the new buildings have done the opposite of encouraging new business development, that the new buildings downtown have done the opposite of that, and that they in themselves have sent the wrong message to the business community, because the buildings have displaced businesses and no effort has been made uh, including the design of the first floor of these buildings to encourage businesses to come into Amherst. And as a resident of a downtown adjacent neighborhood, I want nothing more than to see new retail and service businesses come into downtown. I mean, I would volunteer to work with the BID and the Chamber of Commerce. I think the residents um, who live in the neighborhoods around town, we, we want new businesses. I think sometimes we're seen as anti you know, commercial development, but I can, at a recent conversation that um, the town manager has, I listed, I think, 14 businesses that have disappeared in the 10 years I've lived in Amherst that I regularly use. I miss them dearly. So um, I just, you know, again, want to reiterate that I do support um, the moratorium to plan first before we build. But again, I don't see how the moratorium sends the wrong message to businesses and uh, seriously, if there's anything we in the adjacent downtown neighborhoods can do to work with the bid and the chamber to try and bring new retail and service businesses into the downtown area, um, just call on us. We're there. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you for your comment. Christy Stosh White, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You are unmuted, but your voice is very soft. Can you hear me now? Um, Can you hear me now? You need to turn your volume up, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is Christy Stotch White, and I also um, was not going to speak and reiterate the same thing that everybody had said, but I also was moved by the, the statement of the um, Business Improvement District representative. And um, I guess I'm a little bit restating the person who was just on, um, but I am in favor of the moratorium. I am in favor of um, extending it to nine months to give more time for the consultant and to um, work and to get more input from community members. 
I also um, have noticed many of the businesses that we, our family um, has uh, used to go to um, have disappeared downtown. Businesses like Worlds Apart Games and Amherst Martial Arts and the Amherst Pub and Loose Goose, uh, just to name a few, are gone now. Um, there's, and Shea Albert, um, there's more bubble tea shops. There's a lot more uh, businesses that favor students and um, are not good, as good um, and interesting for families. And um, I would like to see more businesses that um, are great for families and uh, not have the downtown become, you know, another student center. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment, Christy. Ad Adrienne. Therese, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank you, counselors. And um, as a long term resident of Amherst, there are a few issues that raise the temperature of individuals and uh, the collective town. And of course, one of them is zoning. And I'd like to encourage everyone's temperature coming down. And I do see this temporary moratorium as assisting in that way. For me, it's not about should we amend zoning bylaws? It's about what should those zoning bylaws be? And for me, let's not pit people against purpose or power against purpose. And for me, it's about what our community's vision is. And I think a 180 day moratorium brings us to a place to bring down the temperature, to plan, and then to make those zoning amendments. So thank you so much for your time and for your service to this wonderful place we all call home. Adrian, thank you for your comments. Jesse um, Mager. Hi, uh, Jesse Major, I live on Cosby Avenue in the north side of town. Um, again, I won't echo all the comments, which were probably said more eloquently than I would. I just wanted to add one different perspective slightly, uh, which is I'm definitely in favor of the moratorium. And that's because the I fully believe there's a way for us to change and develop our town as successfully as, you know, numerous other cases around the country of small college towns of the same size, which are very vibrant, have lots of small businesses and are a great place to live. And when I moved here 14 years ago, I feel like that's how it was. And all I've seen is mostly it changing towards uh, or away from smaller businesses. And so I, I wholeheartedly believe we can get back there with the right planning. And I just don't see that happening with some of these new projects. Um, so I'll just stop there. And again, thanks, thanks for listening. Jesse, thank you for your comment. Gabrielle Gould. Hi, thank you, Gabrielle Gould. I'm going to first speak as the executive director of the Business Improvement District. Just for clarification, earlier you heard from the Chamber of Commerce. For over 12 months, our businesses in our downtown have operated at less than 20% of business, and that is because we have not had the students, the parents, and the faculty frequenting our stores. So as much as I would love to believe that our community is enough to keep our downtown thriving, it simply is not. We have all done our best. We have gotten more takeout than I've ever eaten in my entire life, and I've done my best to keep shopping downtown. It is not enough. The fact of the matter is, is that we need collective density in our downtown. The current buildings that everybody is so upset about, and I want to use that word everybody because whenever my children say the word everybody to me, I find that very offensive. Not everybody feels that way. Um, I live downtown. I am fortunate to be able to live downtown, and I love the downtown that I moved into. Do I think it needs help? Do I think it needs more? Absolutely. The bid is working on major projects right now, initiatives that will be coming forward to the public if they can all go the way we want them to do, to do a lot of what people are asking for, smaller shops, marketplaces, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things that we are going to need state funding for and things that only us as a 501c can be able to do. In the real world, there is rent to be paid and there are taxes to be paid and it's very difficult to be a small business owner. As someone who has run small businesses myself, I say that with all of the heart. Our businesses are doing their best to stay alive. 
Couple of things I just want to bring up is that the buildings that are downtown are bringing well over a million dollars in taxes versus the $60,000 that the carriage shops brought in. I also want to bring up that I've been able to speak to several of the carriage shops previous owners and they are the ones that said that those businesses were failing long before the businesses were sold, the, the building was sold, and that they were falling apart. They couldn't keep them cool in the summer and they couldn't keep them warm in the winter. In the past two years, it's my understanding from our police chief that three calls have gone to one Kendrick Place and 11, uh, I'm sorry, one EP and Kendrick Place. Um, that means that they are not sucking resources unduly out of our community for the housing that they provide. I also wanna state the incredible diversity that those houses, that that housing provides. It may not provide low income housing and I understand that that is a goal for all of us. Um, but it is normal to live in downtown anywhere in America and have to pay higher rents than you would living on the outskirts of a town. But those buildings have an incredible racial diversity that I think benefits our community greatly. And I see it when I'm walking up and down the streets. I see it when I walk into Lily's. I know that they have been an incredible boon for Paul Shoe Repair and for Henyon Bakery across the street. The people that live in those buildings, they go out and they spend money and they spend money in our downtown. Currently, we are looking at a sea of asphalt and cement that the bid pays someone every day to go clean up. And it is full of bottles and literal human species, and it is disgusting. So the fact that somebody wants to come in and clean that up and build LEED certified platinum buildings into this community, I do not see as a negative thing on any way, shape, or form. And when we're talking about a mere or a small nine months, the only reason our businesses are still in business is because this incredible community helped raise close to $400,000 for the bid and the chamber and the downtown Amherst Foundation to give grants to these businesses and keep them going. And the chamber and the bid have sat with business owners for hours and hours writing grants and helping them get all kinds of state funding. That is the only reason we still have businesses in place because most of them would have been closed if we had not done all of that. I also just want to speak as a resident of 34 Canton Avenue with two children currently in the school system here. Most people cannot be on these calls because they're making dinner for their children. They're catching up on homeschooling because we're all sitting there watching our children learn and I use that in quotes on a screen. We are exhausted and we do not have the time. We should. We wish we could. I have five friends who would love to be on this call right now and make their opinions heard. It is a very privileged thing to be able to sit on this call from 6.30 p.m. until 10 o'clock p.m. to voice our opinions and I count myself lucky to have that privilege. But the, there are not the majority of this community. There are 38,000 members of this community. 15 people does not make a majority. That is at a resident, not as the bid director. I thank you very much for your evening and I know that this is not a voting evening, so this was the wrong tree to die on. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, we have three more comments and I really would like to stop it there. Uh, and one of them is repeat comments. So I'm actually going to suggest that Mary Shaw, Shawhan, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna pronounce your last name correctly. Why don't you enter the room and state your name and where you live, Mary? You need to unmute. Thank you. Mary O'Shaughan, I live on Blackberry Lane in North Amherst. Uh, Amherst. These enormous buildings, I think, where am I? So I understand the economic advantages of having them and I just in support of a moratorium for the time being to look at things more closely before we expand and do sorry that we're having trouble Mary, we did get your statement about 
understanding the economic advantages and but that you support the moratorium. Um, Jennifer Taub, you've spoken before. Is there something that you feel pressing to add? Please enter the room and state your name. She lowered her hand. Okay. Francis Goys, please enter the room and state your name. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Hi, my name is Francis Goyes Flor. I am a renter and I am a resident in Amherst. I'm at 155 Lincoln Avenue, uh, just a couple of blocks from downtown. I understand that there are serious, especially design concerns with the two main buildings that are built in downtown. However, I also know that Amherst has a huge need for more housing of all types. The housing production plan lists more rental housing needed for families and individuals and also appropriate housing for students. Um, there's been ample planning that's been done and I understand that whenever change happens, it's hard, especially for residents that have lived here their entire lives, but I don't think we should let some people that have had the privilege of being able to call this place home, um, disallow others from joining us. I think that Amherst is a very privileged community that has many opportunities. And I think that it's only equitable to allow more folks to live. And even if the buildings, the new buildings are not for lower income households, increasing the supply is also likely to allow those lower income households to be able to live elsewhere. When you don't have enough supply is when we see displacement occur. And I am sure that as you know, displacement primarily affects both lower income households, households of color, who also tend to be renters. So I think that if we want to be an equitable community, we have to keep those considerations in mind. And again, I know that change is difficult and that designs do need to improve, but I, I don't see the moratorium being a solution. And I also worry about what that means for state funding, especially at this time. I know that we're a housing choice community, and I also know that that may be at risk if we go down this route, because then we wouldn't actually be a housing choice community. Um, and that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Francis, thank you for your comments. Um, Janet, we, uh, we really need to go on to the rest of the meeting. Is there something that you feel very pressing to say at this time? Please enter the room. You need to unmute. It makes me really sad when people suggest that those of us who are talking about <clears throat> um, bringing a wider range of business and people downtown, nobody here is saying don't develop housing. Um, what, um, and personally, um, over the last um, five years, I've probably put 2,000 hours along with us. Uh, helping folks um, to uh, become, who, who are very low income and people of color, to become homeowners. So it feels very hurtful to have those comments made. Thank you. Janet, thank you for your comment. We're going to move on to the rest of our meeting. Um, and this, I do want to remind people that there will be additional periods both at the planning board, CRC, and possibly other options. We're going to move to the consent agenda. Could you please show the consent agenda on the screen? The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later, please ask me 
as I list that item or after I list all the items and the request to remove does not require a second. I'm going to read this as a motion and I will be looking for a second to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. The first three are the suspension of town council rules of procedure 8.4 for the following agenda items. 8E, adoption of financial orders FY21-12, FY21-13, and FY22-07. 8F, intramural agreements. 8G, authorization for superintendent schools, foster care, transportation. That was just the suspension of the rules 8.4. 6.2 is the adoption of the 2021 Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month Proclamation. 8E is adoption of the following financial orders. Um, F2112-12, free cash to stabilization fund. F21-13, rescind authorized un issued debt. FY22-07, Community Preservation Act projects allocations. Please note that does not include the Jones Library. 8F, authorization for town manager to enter into the following intergovernmental agreements. Sealer of weights and measures with the city of Northampton for FY21. Mun municipal hearing officer with the city of Northampton for FY21, Veterans Services with the City of Northampton and the towns of Amherst, Chester, Chesterfield, Cummington, Goshen, Hadley, Middlefield, Pelham, Williamsburg, and provision of the ambulance service to the town of Leverett for FY21 and 22, provision of the ambulance services to the town of Pelham for FY21 and 22, Provision of ambulance services to the town of Shutesbury for FY21 and 22. Agreement for dog kennel services with the city of Northampton for FY21. Paramedic intercept services with the city of Northampton for FY21. Paramedic intercept services with the town of Hadley for FY21. And then we go on to 8G, authorization for superintendent of schools, foster care transportation, and 11A, approval of minutes, March 8th, regular town council meeting minutes. Is there any request to remove an item? I have a point of order. Yes. Um, you missed the paramedic intercept services with Turner's Falls when you read that. Thank you. <clears throat> add the paramedic intercept services with Turner's Falls Fire Department for FY21. Thank you. Darcy? Yeah, I, I just have a question um, about um, the um, financial orders. And um, I guess I just don't understand if in the, in the packet, in the document, with regard to the CPAC funding, it does include the Jones Library. So could you explain why? And we're, we're voting on that, right? Yes, the actual financial order does not include the Jones Library and we're voting on the financial order. The packet includes the, the overall report for CPA but the actual financial order, okay. what we looked at earlier, does not include Jones Library. And so did we already vote on that or is that coming up? No. Jones Library will not come up until April 5th. So that will be included on that day, the yes, CPAC yeah. funding? Yes. Okay. All right, Andy Steinberg. Yes, I request the removal of order FY2207 Community Preservation Act project allocations from the consent agenda. That's 8E, 
I'm not objecting to inclusion under Rule 8.4. This has to do with the adoption. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so the order that I've read earlier includes everything previously listed. What it does not include now is uh, adoption of the financial order F. Y 22-07 Community Preservation Act project allocations. It does, however, allow us above to still act on that this evening after it comes to a vote. Is there any further questions or requests? I'll just for formality make a second on the motion. Thank you, Mandy Jo. I pre appreciate that I was ready to ask for that as soon as we got there. Any other questions or, or requests? All right, hearing none, I'm going to move to a vote. And the vote I will start with is uh, Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Grease Murray is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. I'm sorry. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. It's unanimous 13, 0, 0, and none absent. Okay, we are going to move on to the North Common. There is a very, very brief presentation. Uh, then we also have a couple of earlier uh, comments and we will take public comment, although I'll be asking how many people want to comment. Then we'll move to the council discussion and a motion and vote. Uh, so, Athena, I think we're going to show the two different maps. And Guilford, you are making the presentation, correct? Uh, yes, I'm making the presentation tonight. Thank you. Um, there's really, you've heard, everyone's heard the presentation before. Um, you have the memo which shows the two differences. The plan you're seeing now is what we're calling 2B. Um, it shows that you have parking on the common still, and um, you have no parking on Main Street, and you have some parking on Boltwood Avenue. The drawing you're looking at does show Boltwood being one way to the south, the way it's set up. Um, and if you if we get into more discussions about one-way traffic and two-way traffic, I can explain that better. Um, the next drawing is the three, option three, three B. Um, the parking has left the common. Um, we have parking on Main Street and we've added part and we still have the parking on Boltwood and it's one way. Um, in the table and your in the handout that was given to you, we talked about the um, parking changes. Right now, there's a total of 43 spaces in this area with the parking lot the way it is now before we do any work. If we go to plan 2B2 two modified, we'll have 38 spaces. And if we go to the plan 3B, which you're looking at now, we'll have 27 spaces. Um, if we just repaved the parking lot and leave it the way it is now. We do lose about five spaces in the parking lot because we actually will lay the spaces out to their proper sizes and not some of them are small spaces right now. So as you, um, that's the basic what we've been talking about for a while. Um, I can't really add much more to it. So I'm willing to wait, take questions if you're willing to, if you want to do questions. Okay. Are there questions from the council? Did you make 
that a little larger. Shalini. You can't see it. Yeah, I was interested in the feedback that was collected from um, businesses about the different plans, if that's possible. Uh -huh. The head of the executive director of the bid is going to speak and I'll ask her to address that. Okay. Kathy, are there questions at this time? Yes. Um, my question is the financing of this. Um, the other part of the memo said the amount of money, including the new awards from CPAC, the $500,000 and money that had been allocated in previous years is about 1.4 million. Does 1.4 million cover both plan, I, I keep calling them plan one and plan two, but modified plan two and 3B. Um, so we've got that much money, the balance is 1.4. And I just wanna know, as we're looking at this, um, I, whether that is enough money, because there was one, there was a discussion at the Com Community Preservation Act of having to go out for a grant to supplement this money. So I just would like an answer to that. Our plan right now is to build to the $1.4 million. We believe we'll be able to do it. We may have to change some of the materials and go with the less expensive material versus the more expensive material, but we plan to build to the $1.4 million. Thank you. And, and just while I have you on your face anyway, Guilford, um, the, the one with the parking lot still there, can that be, that is going to be flat as I understood from an original Chris breast up presentation. So if we thought of it as a space that if we uh, cordoned it off, we could put tables out, we could have a performance there, we could have a gathering there. So it's not slanted the way it is now. Am I correct? It would be a flat space that could be used that way? The one with the parking lot, that that parking lot could be used that way. It will be less slope than it is now, but it won't be totally flat. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to move to uh, some public comment. We have, in fact, uh, asked Gabrielle Gould to speak on behalf of the bid. Gabrielle, would you please enter the room? And um, people ha are interested in the survey you did and also additional comments. Hi, am I here? Yes. Thank you. We ran a survey going door to door to each of the businesses directly impacted by the work being done on the common um, all the way down Main Street to um, just below uh, Black Sheep. We went into the Boltwood uh, Johnny's uh, area, uh, Arigato down to Amherst Coffee, Amherst Cinema, and, um, and then, of course, along both South Pleasant and all of, of Main Street facing the common. So you've just, so everybody understands it's La Vera Cruzana, et cetera. And, you know, if you look at um, Main Street, you're talking about Formosa, um, Pasti Basta, Russell's Liquors. Um, the uh, overwhelming consensus, 60% um, of the business owners requested that some form of parking remain um, with 30% saying they would prefer to see all of the parking go and 10% um, liking neither. And I'm sure anybody who has been downtown long enough knows who that 10% is. Um, the Even out of the 60%, there was a lot of heartfelt, I wish it could be all not parking. Uh, we, would, we think that that would be more beautiful. We think that that would be a, a better long-term uh, position, but at this point, they feel that parking is going to remain important. I think before COVID, we were fortunate to come before the council with our wonderful plans of destination Amherst, and those have not died by any measure. But our hopes when we presented that to the council was that we would be bringing the parking garage to you 
in uh, tandem with the redo of the North Common or before the North Common, but due to COVID and a million other reasons, that was not the case. It is still our intention, should this council deem it appropriate to change the zoning of the CVS parking lot that is town owned and put out an RFP, we would like to be one of the uh, uh, private entities that apply for the RFP to be able to build this community parking garage. But unfortunately right now that's not on the table. So we have to look at the common without that as an option. And again, we're looking at a 60 30 split on that uh, from our standpoint. And I speak for our board of directors, anything, anything will be better than what our offices look at every day. Um, I have said this to several of you in person or on calls. When we had the Mary Maple strung this year, the uh, landscaping company who we hired to do that for us told us that many of those branches are really about to come down. It is a dying tree and it is getting dangerous. Uh, we have ideas for a new tradition of Mary Maple part two for the future. And we look forward to seeing the heart and center of our downtown made beautiful, pedestrian friendly and accessible for all. Thank you. I also would like to call on uh, Tom, the Reverend Tom Sinen, who is from Grace Episcopal Church. Please bring him into the room and and have him unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't planning to speak. My senior warden is also uh, present. But uh, what what can, what would you like me to tell you? Well, we understand that at times you have spoken with Dave Zomack. Yes. If you would like, we can bring your senior uh, warden in instead, but we didn't know which one of you would like to speak. Uh, we, we met with uh, Dave and Christine earlier this month, uh, were present, were, the two proposals were presented to uh, myself and members of our vestry. Uh, and we submitted a letter when we, for the meeting that was supposed to be taking place earlier this month, stating our position um, that ultimately, uh, if the town council decides to um, go forward with the renovation of the North Common, um, we lean in the direction of plan to be and in particular I, I think our our position is a lot is quite similar to many of the businesses about the need for parking in the area for those of us who who function and operate around the common and that and, and I think also just to express our concern is not just it's about Sunday morning for us it's it's the fact that parking in downtown Amherst in the evening is a very uh, competitive operation trying to get a spot, uh, whether or not you're going to uh, Amherst Cinema or you're going to one of the restaurants. Um, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, we have things happening in our church in the, in the early evening, almost every night, the choir rehearsals, 12-step programs, uh, outside groups renting from us, uh, our own meetings and so on. So um, a, a thing we often hear regardless of the of the the work of the north common is we always keep hearing how difficult it is for people to find parking in the evening okay uh, excuse me reverend but is christopher Fretag? yes why don't we bring him into the room as well good evening can you hear me yes we can well, thank you very much. I'm Chris Freitag. I'm the senior warden for Grace Church. And I thank you for letting me um, uh, have a few minutes here. Again, I think uh, the Reverend, Reverend Sinan um, reiterated some of what we put in our note to the council. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Mooring uh, discussed a little bit about one-way traffic and it's been explained to us multiple times, even though the plans didn't show it, that should uh, plan two, which is the preferred plan 
not only by businesses, but I know that uh, Grace is, is leaning towards the preserved parking, is that this parking in front of Town Hall, that section of Bullwood would be two-way. So it would allow traffic from the parking lot to go out onto Main Street and head away, as opposed to funneling all the traffic from Main Street, from the front parking lot, from the parking behind Town Hall to in front of the church. And unfortunately, when uh, Saturday's farmer market is there, in the past, that part of Boltwood in front of the inn at Boltwood has been closed. So all this traffic would come through the church down Spring Street and then to get out. So it, it seems like quite a bottleneck there on Saturdays when the farmer market is there, if in fact that two-way designation for in front of town hall is not preserved. So, you know, again, we, we keep hearing about it, but even as Guilford said this evening, it's one way. So, you know, that, that's a major concern along with the thought of even losing parking. So, you know, I'd like a clarification on that and at least get the drawings updated to say what you mean so that we have a better idea as to what type of traffic pattern is going to be coming through that area, especially on Saturdays uh, with the farmer's market. But that's what I have to say for now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to both of you for joining us this evening. Um, Guilford, did you have any comment with regard to that clarification? So um, as far as if you look at the plan, either one of the plans, if you want to bring one, bring it up. Either two or three B. Both of which have been amended. Lynn, can you bring the one with the parking lot on it so we can see that's the going in and out of the parking lot? So this is 3B and this is 2. So as you, as you look, um, we did lay this out as one way down this way. So if you want to make this road two way, there's two choices and it's in your, in your uh, discussion package. If you want to keep it two way, we need, need to either get rid of parking on one side of the road, either get rid of this parking or move the parking in the sidewalk into the common about six to eight feet. So you can have two way, you have to get rid of the parking or you have to move the parking in the sidewalk into the common. Um, and those are your two options. And, and we kind of showed you one way because one way is the least um, least um, impact to the common itself at this time. And then if we, if you want to adjust it, there's no really, it, it, it's easy to adjust it into the common. It's easy to take the parking out on the common side. Um, but this shows you the most parking you can have there um, works best with one way. Okay. Are there any, does it, do any other counselors need to see the drawings anymore? I just, can, Alan, can I, this is Kathy, I just, what the Reverend said was he originally thought to get in and out of the parking lot, not all the way down, but just right in front of Town Hall, you could exit turning left and then go on Main Street the way you can now. So Guilford, I think, is saying you can't do that. So you can come in, but you have to go, there's not even that little piece in front of Town Hall that could be two-way to just get out of the parking lot and not go down Boltwood. If you really, really want to have two way so you can go out of the parking lot, you can't have two way at that end and you have one way in front of the church. It would be very confusing. All right, I'm going to ask if there's any public comment at this time.
Right. Then I'm going. I don't see any, so I'm going to go back to the counselors and uh, ask for questions or comments. Darcy. Yeah, I just wanted to have a clarification. When we we had the um, presentation at um, TSO, I asked the question about um, can we cap the spending at the amount that we have? And at that time, um, the answer was no, um, that we were expecting that it was gonna cost more. But what I'm hearing you say right now is yes, that, we're, that we, we have decided to cap the spending on the project to, with, at the amount that we currently have. Is that correct or am I hearing it wrong? That's correct. We've done some more estimates and played with some numbers some more and we're, we're confident we can get this done in the amount of money we have. It may be more asphalt than people want and maybe less granite, more concrete steps. Um, those types of things may play into the mix. But yes, we feel like the 1.4 we can get this project built as you choose one of these two options. Thank you. Kathy. I, I just want to um, give some feedback that I've heard from residents. I mean, as you know, I'm the district counselor for the north part of Amherst, so I don't live downtown. But the number of people who talk about that lot in particular being important to them um, because they come down, they go into town hall, they pay a bill, they pick up something, they go to a meeting, they're in and out. So it's the in and out lot. They're not coming for a long time. Um, and, and it gets huge even with that it's difficult to find a space. So it's it's of high value because it's highly used and there aren't a lot, a lot of other spaces for that whole cluster that's downtown. And the I know we got a strong letter from Amherst Cinema. The overflow from the cinema is huge. You can go behind this cinema lot and it's full. People come in jockeying for positions in this small lot on North Common. So we do have this other beautiful common. It's not that we don't have green. And I've watched the Belchertown parking lot that's on their commons right in front of their town hall. It's busy, especially when they have festivals. So it's, it is a feature of a lot of New England towns when they don't have vast other places to park. So I just wanted to make that observation on its value to people. Um, and then the other thing is just on a very personal level, when we were meeting in the town council, in the town room, I often had to come down an hour early to find a space to park. And we were meeting at 6.30. Um, you know, if I, if I tried to cut it close and get down at six o'clock, I, I sometimes parked um, a 20 minute, 30 minute walk away. I would just drive up and down streets. That lot was completely full. And I'm talking about, you know, after five o'clock. So people were using it for evening, for meetings and others that it's um, for those of you who can walk into town or bike, but um, it, it's also really good for people who are all handicapped, um, you know, impaired because they don't have to walk very far. So it it's central to us. And, to, and unless we have a real alternative right now, I think we need it. There Schwartz. So <clears throat> I'm going to agree with everything that Kathy just said about why that's important. Um, new comments would be that, um, so you, there are businesses that are there like the liquor store, right? And so if that's a liquor store you've used for 25 years and you need to get home because you got to feed your wife supper and she expects it by six and you want to bring home a drink, you want to park close to that, walk in, get what you need and go home. If you have any limitations on your abilities, um, you're going to then, if you cannot park close, if you have to park with CVS and walk up, you're gonna go into Hadley 
and you're going to park in their big parking place and you're going to go to liquors 44. Um, the other thing is, is that we have a beautiful town hall and the parking in front to me seems welcoming to people that need to come in, run into town hall and get a map or get a permit or get their dog license. And I think that the people that still do that are the people that maybe are older or who don't have the money for a computer, aren't computer savvy. And I think taking that parking lot away sort of sends the message that maybe town hall doesn't want people to have easy access to town hall. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I think during COVID-19, we've this pandemic time, we've, we've uh, learned that people need some places to be able to meet and churches um, are one of them. And I think it's really important that if the church is saying that it's going to affect their parishioners, I think we also heard, I think it was brought up that it could affect funeral processions. I think we have to listen to them. I think churches are one of the places like libraries that are really important. And I would object to having the street be anything other than two way. And I think that maybe we should explore um, whether or not we want to take part of the common or not. Dorothy Pam. I certainly think that Sarah made a lot of good points, but um, I'm coming down on the opposite side. I think that the uh, town hall is a beautiful and eccentric building and that we should have be able to see it, that people coming into town should be able to see it without the, the screen of cars. Um, countering something Kathy said, I have never not gotten a parking spot for a town council meeting because I, Paul Bockelman told me about parking behind town hall, uh, which is there. Um, but I want to talk about why I think we can solve this problem in a way that will work. We had a parking consultant a couple of years ago, and he talked about lots of little small parking places that existed that were private. And he said that, that we could make some arrangements um, and make some of them small uh, per, available for public parking. And, you know, I'm not really good with some of this tech stuff, but there are people that use their phone to find parking spots that actually use their phone to pay the meter. And that can tell you where these little parking spots exist. And if we can't find them behind uh, local businesses where there um, are available spots, then maybe we can make a deal with Amherst College, which has parking lots nearby. I mean, it is too bad we lost the Spring Street lot, okay? I am gonna remind us that that was, I think, a bad decision. But many things take place in front of Town Hall, which are very meaningful. The, 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 the civic ceremonies, take place in that region, the flag raisings, the proclamation readings. And I, I find that the drawings that uh, Gilbert presented with the, Gilbert presented with the, um, that a, a green flat free area that was open to public life, uh, it was just very attractive to me. So I'm not saying we don't need the parking. I'm saying, let's get more inventive. Let's find the spots, let make, create more public spots in and around that area, but to free the town green, it's a very small, it's a very small green. We're gonna spend a lot of money, whatever we do on it. And I think that we should be able to see it and enjoy it and use it in the best way. Uh, George Ryan. I wanna um, follow up with Dorothy in support of, of this plan 3B. Um, first of all, it's not a choice between parking and no parking, in fact, as you can see from the chart, there's an only a difference of 11 spaces between the two plans. And while I realize that there's going to be some inconvenience, I'm not sure 11 spaces really is, 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 uh, is an, an overwhelming argument in favor of, of maintaining all that asphalt um, and a kind of unwelcoming, unwelcoming space in front of town hall. So first, I just point out that the difference in spaces is really not very large. And I think what we gain from plan 3B Besides the green, which I think is precious, and so a place for people to sit and read or play chess or have a sandwich. Um, and there's still seven, seven parking spaces right there for those who just need to come in and go out. What we really gain, it means the most to me, is what Dorothy pointed out. It's that civic space. Um, I think many of us have had, uh, at least I have had, some very uh, powerful moments um, when members of our community, we had Tibet Day the other day, uh, Puerto Rican Heritage Day, 
uh, Black Month uh, celebrations. We've had a series of important events um, that are held on a regular basis where we gather as a community. A flag is often raised, uh, speeches and, and proclamations are read, and people gather. And to me, that I don't know if we could put that plan up again, but just to keep in mind that space that's created um, right in front of town hall, right by the flagpole, to me is a very meaningful uh, action, especially coming out of COVID that uh, draws people together. So for those reasons, I think, um, while I acknowledge the inconvenience that will be for some, I think it's far outweighed by the advantages of the green space um, and by the possibility of creating a true civic space in front of town hall. Amy Steinberg. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat everything that the last couple speakers just said. I agree with them that the purpose of having a town common is the green, the enjoyment of the uh, fact that there is a green space. Uh, when uh, Ms. Gould spoke on behalf of the, um, uh, the the bid, she talked about that as being um, something of value, and she recognized that it there was a uh, a split decision amongst the members uh, um, of the business community who were uh, polled. Uh, but it is eleven spaces. There are there was a creative part of 3B that has not been mentioned, and that is um, angled parking spaces off of Main Street that um, um, do replace a good bit of the parking that's lost. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of saying, well, we can't do it because we don't have the, any new parking uh, accommodated now, um, doesn't really solve the problem of we're looking at a long-term solution for the North Common. And I think we have to make the decision as to what's the right long-term solution. And I think the 3B is the right long-term solution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Alyssa? There you go. I, I couldn't tell if I was hearing my last name or my first name. I got so confused. Thank you. Um, so obviously I'm in disagreement with the last couple of speakers based on things I've said in the past. So I'll try not to repeat new things and just kind of build off of some of the things other people have said. I do use Park Mobile to pay for my parking spaces. That app doesn't tell me where the available spaces are. Those do exist in other communities. We don't have that yet, so that's not going to tell me. I've been parking for meetings a lot longer than Dorothy Pam has, and I can tell you that, no, there often aren't spaces behind Town Hall, nor in front of Town Hall, nor in Spring Street during the nights of what used to be select board meetings and were later town council meetings. So obviously we all have our own experiences, but I can tell you that that has been mine. I want to make sure it's clear that um, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other for a change um, about something, which is in regards to one or two way traffic on Boltwood. So I'm willing to listen to others. And I think we haven't perhaps discussed that enough as to how that really impacts everybody. And I really appreciate hearing from the church on that because I think they've been clearest about their concerns associated with that. In terms of me wanting to keep some parking on the common, I of course do not see it as detrimental. I do see it as a welcoming space that exists now. I have been to many, many, many events in the 20 years I've lived here that have been exactly around the flagpole. I've been to many events that have been further over in the North Common section. We haven't needed the space in the parking lot. What we have needed is we've needed those spaces for elderly people and people with disabilities who can't walk very far to the flagpole or to the section of the North Common where we're meeting and celebrating Veterans Day or uh, other, my, other items. So I think a lot of this is perspective based on what people's experiences are. And I am going to say that I've had many, many years of experience with this. And so I don't, I get frustrated when I hear people saying it's not a big deal to lose those parking spaces. It in fact, to me, is a very big deal for all the reasons that other people have stated and that I've said. There is a clear majority, not a split, but a clear majority of businesses that depend on drop-in business, not a business by appointment, or that have a couple of their own parking spaces. 
a clear majority of businesses that depend on drop-in business say that they want that parking to remain. So for us to just say, yeah, but it would look so much prettier if we didn't have the parking there, just really smacks of privilege to me and in a way that doesn't make sense if we're supporting our business community, particularly as they struggled come out of the pandemic. I would like to have a little more talk about the back in angle parking. As most of you know, I went through the angst over the very first roundabout we built in town. So I'm certainly aware of how worried people are about change, but I'm wondering if this is actually a reasonable place to put back in angle parking for the first time at Amherst. And I'm also wondering what our options are in terms of if we put it in and then we say, you know, this isn't really working, although I think people could learn, um, then if we take it out, what the impact is of that. Thank you. Mandy Johanneke. Is it okay to make a motion right now or should I wait? Please go ahead. I move to approve plan 3B as shown with no modifications. Is there a second? I'm sorry, who seconded? Evan? Evan. Thank you. May I speak to Please. it? Please. Okay. So plan 3B eliminates 11 spots from plan two. As many people have said, if there wasn't parking on the common, we would not be having this discussion because at this point in time, we would never choose to add parking specifically on the common. We have a downtown parking study that we dealt with a little over a year ago that showed in Appendix A on page 26 of that appendix, um, parking utilization that did not show at any time on a Thursday or a Saturday when they did the study for utilization, parking, public parking utilization in downtown exceeding 90%, not at a single point in time on those two days. If we eliminate 11 slots, it still will not exceed 90% on any of the days. If we're going to do studies on parking utilization, we should you know, pay attention to those studies, which showed that we have plenty of public parking in town. What it showed and what we as a council actually voted to ask the town manager to do was we need signage. Um, those That parking lot right there on the common might be used most because it's the easiest to find not because it's the most convenient. Um, I think we need to go with signage. I think we need to get rid of parking on the common because we need a nice common that people can use, that people can sit out and actually eat at or gather at. Um, we're building, as Andy said, for 50 years, not 10. We should return the common to what it was meant to be, a common for all people, not a parking lot. Steve Schreiber. Wow. Um, I have nothing more to say. So uh, plus one to what to what Mandy said. What, what Mandy said. Okay, Evan Ross. <laughs> right. Uh, also plus one. A lot of what I was going to say has been said. Um, I think that in the public comment we heard earlier, we heard a lot of talk about. Um, making decisions that have long-term impact for generations to come. And to me, this is one of those. It is unlikely we will redo the common after this project for a very long time. And so I think we do need to be thinking long range. I think we need to be thinking in terms of what do we want our downtown to look like? And I think we also need to be thinking in terms of how this matches up with our climate action goals. And I think um, pave, continuing to pave over our common, pave over downtown green space, uh, to continue the support of uh, cars is, is short-sighted. Um, I understand the concern over losing parking. I don't really think that 11 space is that big a deal, but building on what Mandy said, she mentioned that we have a downtown parking study that we should listen to. I want to continue on that and say we have the recommendations from the downtown parking working group. One of my biggest frustrations, I think, on this council has been uh, the amount of money that this town spends on consultant reports that we then put on shelves and don't pay any attention to. That plan gave us a whole lot of uh, solutions to parking problems, some of them which are pretty low cost, like restriping from 22 feet to 20 feet. And we have just ignored all of the hard work of that citizen group. And now we're talking about making a major capital investment of repaving a parking lot instead of considering other ways that we can offset the loss of those 11 spaces throughout the town. Uh, 
uh, be, you know, with Dorothy said, Dorothy said, being more creative. I, I don't necessarily want to lose that parking, but I don't think that that is the place for that parking. I think that there are other ways that we can um, offset those spaces, uh, which at the end are only 11. So that wasn't my most articulate way of saying things because everyone took most of what I was going to say, um, but I am support in support of Plan 3B. I'm going to skip over Sarah because you've spoken already and go to Shalini. Hmm. Uh, yes, to many of the things that have been said, I do uh, agree that we want to have a long term vision and given that we are considering a parking garage down the road. Um, and the other thing I wanted to highlight also was we've seen examples of the block party where we actually blocked out so much of the parking and it was really the, and yet people came and it was a building that community. And so we can create these spaces downtown where people can bring out their dining and sit and congregate. I think that can be really uh, very useful. The one question, oh, and the other thing was, can we, two questions, can we make it one way for now, but once we have the garage, could we open that up and make it two way? in the future. Uh, and the other question was, how many handicapped parking spaces are we losing? Um, Justin, please go ahead. So yes, if you went with plan three, our plan two, and you set it up for parking on both sides of Boltwood, and after the garage is open, you decide you wanna remove the parking on the common side, that's just a matter of taking meters out <clears throat> and repainting the road and that parking would go away and you could have two-way traffic there without encroaching onto the common. So yes, that's doable in the future. The second is, is there's two handicap spaces in the, in the area now and when we're done, there'll be two handicap spaces. And that was, okay. Thank you, um, Darcy, you've not spoken, please go ahead. Um, I would like to say that I, I agree to a large extent with what Alyssa said um, and um, that I find it kind of um, um, not shocking, but just hard to believe that after, after uh, doing so much to try to help our downtown businesses during COVID that we are not really um, making sure that we're paying attention to what they need now. Um, and um, it feels uh, like we are superimposing some kind of value on the situation. Um, I also think we have like an amazing uh, park system in our downtown. With the, with the South and North Common that we already have, Kendrick Park. Um, I mean, we have a great downtown park system. So it's not really like we need to have this Crown Jewel Park. But um, anyway, I also feel like um, uh, I agree with Evan that we have to look at climate considerations and that um, with whatever we do, we need to sort of, uh, you know, have an in, take an inventory of what, what, um, you know, have an in, greenhouse gas impact report on what all of our projects are creating because we're trying to meet this goal, uh, and it's you know the more we do uh, to. Um, the more projects we do, the more we sort of, the slower we can, we can, um, slower it is that we can accomplish our, our climate action goals. So, you know, my, my, my actual preference would be to just upgrade the green space of the North Common and just, you know, leave the parking lot or, you know, upgrade it as in the existing parking lot. Sarah, you had your hand up before Kathy, so I'm going to call on you and then I'll go to Kathy. So one of the things I was gonna say is that location is really important. So 
Evening hours are very busy trying to get into meetings at night. And when I was on finance committee, I'm going to echo what Alyssa said you if there was any kind of events in town, uh, people going to movies, you had to drive around forever. So and also just to get into the businesses that are there and to town hall. Um, you if you are 74 and you are a cancer survivor, you might not be able to walk from the CVS parking lot down. I, we, you need some kind of parking there. Um, the other thing is we have the South Common, which is huge and beautiful. And then when you turn the corner and you're looking towards Lime Red, not even, I mean, probably 65 feet from the town hall's second entrance is Sweetster Park, which has a fountain and which has permanent benches. So we do have a place for seating. For me, it just, it seems really, it seems like in some ways a vanity project. And the other thing is, is that I don't know when people will ever get away from cars completely. So eventually you could have charging stations there for electric cars. I think until this town actually really, really finds a way to make public transportation dependable and regular, I think we can't just wish away cars. We can't just say, I'm going to not make a space. And so people from out of town or people from the north or the south end of town, you're just going to have to find a way to get there. I don't think there's common sense involved. Kathy Shane. Okay, I, I have a question and then I just wanted to build on what Sarah said. My question when I look at the budget, um, and I thought I remembered you saying that the transportation fund money, which makes this possible, 450,000 was assuming a parking lot. Um, do we have that 450,000 if we don't have a parking lot? So it's, that's a question just on money. The second is um, the observation in addition to all the little businesses around the green, we have two major draws to downtown right now. We don't have huge numbers. Emmer Cinema, and they, it was a cry of pain from them at the thought of losing this overflow lot for them. And the church. So I'm listening to what the church said about two-way, and I'm not completely averse from taking a little bit of the park along the edge to leave two ways along there. If that, if that's, we have a design choice on that. But I, I just think we need to listen to the downtown businesses as well as the people who come downtown. And I read the charking study extremely well, Mark Nandy. They did not talk about this lot. They still assumed some parking spaces that had long since disappeared with One East Pleasant. They didn't do their homework the second time around with the amount of cars downtown. They just, they, they took some old data on some of these. These places at various times of day are full um, and you circle. So it isn't, um, it, we did do the survey and if you le read those answers, there were some that were distraught. They weren't just on the fence, they were distraught. Steve Schreiber. If I park on my front lawn, um, John Thompson will write me a hundred dollar ticket per day. We do not allow parking on front lawns of houses in Amherst. I do not understand why we allow parking on the town's front lawn. That was a grave mistake that was made sometime in the, the, era, the 50s. We have a chance to rectify that. So that we, that's been a 60 year, 70 year experiment that needs to go away. And this is our one shot at it. Habits are really hard to change. You, you know, you're absolutely right that um, the proximity to those stores along um, Main Street and along um, South Pleasant Street, people are in the habit of parking there. That's totally, I totally get that. Uh, habits can also change. Um, I think that the net of 11 spaces is really nothing. And I, I'll, <laughs> says a guy that hardly ever drives into town because he, he walks into town, but it's just where we're, debating and discussing and um, uh, you know, basically 11 spaces. On-street parking is the most efficient way to park because basically the road is already your drive aisle. You don't have to also build a road. 
So basically by putting any parking on the common, you have to build a road, the drive aisle to get to the parking, and then you have to have the parking. Um, I just want to repeat one thing that Mandy said that the town common is, or I'm going to paraphrase it, the town common is the most democratic space in Amherst, other than possibly the public library. That's another discussion, but the town common is the most democratic space that we have. It was, that's the purpose of a town common. That's why it's called the common. So what do we want to do with our common? Do we want that to be temporary space for somebody's car so they run in, I, so that for somebody's car? Not everybody drives, not everybody has cars. No, but not everyone has access to that space. Or do we want to make the common for everyone? So uh, I feel strongly that this is our shot to change a mistake that was made a half a century ago. And it's the right decision, 3B. Uh, seeing no other comments, I'm going to ask the town clerk to repeat the motion. I'm to sorry. approve plan 3B as shown with no modifications. Okay, is there any further comment or question? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it to the vote. And I'm going to start uh, with Brewer. Are you using first names or last names? I'm so I'm sorry, confused. Alyssa. Alyssa thank Brewer. you. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Although I know we're alphabetized by last name. I'm voting no. Thank you. Pat DeAngelis? No. Darcy Dumont? No. Reesmer is a yes. Haneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. No. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Stanley Balmilne. Yes. The way I counted, it's eight in favor and five opposed. No abstentions and no absence. Is that correct, Athena? That's what I have. Thank you. Uh, we are going to take a five minute break and be back um, for the temporary building moratorium bylaw. We'll join 8B next. It is the proposed temporary building moratorium bylaw. There is a brief presentation and then based on some counselor questions, uh, I have asked the town planning staff to provide answers to those questions. That was completely at my request. Um, and then we will move to counselor discussion and a vote. Uh, and before we, after we get done with the presentations and the brief clarification, I will talk more about the vote. So let's start with the brief presentation. I, uh, Kathy, Dorothy and uh, Darcy are making this presentation. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm going to lead off for the three of us, and um, we have focus on trying to keep this brief. Um, my role is to say why we need a moratorium and why we need it now. And I just want to stress, this is a moratorium on permits for multi-unit residential projects in the downtown and adjacent areas. It's three or more. It's not to stop business development downtown it would allow home development it would allow duplex it would allow various other things it's just to, to put a pause button on it we need to do this because we really need a vision of the direction of change i think many of us and you heard eloquent voices better than mine um, earlier tonight um, saying that this is not anti-new development. It's just the, the size, the shape, what it feels like, and what we can have, our vision of what we could have downtown and what we're gonna have for years matters. And we need design standards. We just don't have them. Why now? Why is this urgent now? There are multiple reasons. The first is the council is actively considering new bylaws that would define what a mixed use building is. What's supposed to be downstairs in these residential buildings? Can we have shops? 
and discussing inclusionary zoning for any building with 10 units or more. So we would get affordable units when a large residential structure comes in. The timing is perfect to wait for those, have those buildings wait so we do acquire those units. Second, we've had experience. We've had good experience with developments that added over 200, 227 residential units downtown without provision for parking, without walkable sidewalks where two people could pass with strollers, with kids, with walkers, um, with large shadows cast because they come right out to the street with no place to sit outside if you wanna have convening, welcoming places. And meanwhile, they display small businesses. This means we re need to rethink the current zoning visions. It's not to stop a building from coming in, but have it set back, have some street design, and those are absent from our current zoning laws. And third, and very importantly, the planning staff had proposed a consultant project that would lead public meetings and recommend design guidelines and streetscape, streetscape improvements that could go into our zoning law. So the time is really ripe to hit the pause button and think about what we could have. So when new developments come into town, they bring us what we would really like to see. And it's not to stop it, not even to stop people living downtown, but to give that space that we can see in part of our town that we're losing. And I am now going to turn it over to Dorothy, but I just wanna stress the urgency. And the other thing as I'm talking about this is we put out that we were going to do this. The newspaper picked it up and we had people clamoring to sign our moratorium. Say, where can I sign just to show? And we had nearly 250 signatures without much effort. So it's a chorus of voices, not saying stop development, but saying, let's think about it because we're going to live with it for a long time. It's a pro-business, pro-downtown business argument that we're making. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Kathy. So what will we gain with a moratorium? Uh, words matter, people matter, and history matters. And what is Amherst? A city, a neighborhood, or a community? We all decide what kind of place we want to live in. Before we moved to Amherst, we checked out towns in the vicinity of my daughter and grandchildren. Because we value community and neighborliness, we chose to live in the RG, Precinct 10, within walking distance of downtown, yet full of owner-occupied houses, both big and small, and friendly people of all ages living. This is a neighborhood of socially responsible problem solvers who figured out a way to slow the conversion of one family owner occupied homes into unsupervised student rentals with the rental reg registration program. I live next door to a large house filled with students who value this neighborhood and behave appropriately. This is a neighborhood whose members have served and still serve on all committees of town government. This is a neighborhood that hosts monthly brunches open to all students, teachers, and homeowners. We know that the way to get more affordable housing in Amherst is not to replace family homes with the kind of expensive, high rent, small apartment buildings necessary for a builder to make a profit. What is needed is across the board inclusionary zoning for the large buildings being built downtown. What is needed is public funding and or land donations such as have created Amherst successful affordable developments such as Olympia Oaks and the up upcoming affordable housing on Deltertown Road and East Pleasant Street School property. Merely increasing the supply of apartment building units does not lead to increased affordability. Rather, it raises the prices of surrounding properties. My neighbors who live downtown, who chose to live downtown because of the past, they enjoyed walking and shopping there. But now, so many of the small unique stores have been replaced. These buildings with plate glass windows stare back at us and invite no one in. It's harder to find a destination. The town is spending a lot of money making Kendrick Park a lovely place for families, children, and people young and old to gather. But who will play on the imaginative structures in this land? Where are the children? If they come from outside the area with their parents and grandparents, where's the rest of The loose goose, which in the past sold cookies to happy children, as the public service restroom is a thing of the past. Now I would hesitate to walk past the jutting corner of one East Cleft, children in hand, as an exuberant child dash off the narrow sidewalk into the street. Remember my days pushing one child in a baby carriage and walking with one or two more rambunctious children on the way to the park, I shudder to take the next morning. So as I looked at the setbacks today, it became clear we need a consultant. The setbacks from the street to sidewalk width that looks appropriate on a two-story building do not work on a tall building. Even the project have large grassy spaces around them. We need to have the shadows of the existing and prospective buildings measured um, 
to guide buildings so that Kendrick Park does not become a shadowy, uninviting place where nothing grows. We need to know how much space feels inviting to people for small plazas, courtyards, and insets for outdoor dining and benches for sitting that the planning department is talking about. We need to have a more detailed public engagement process to find out what our residents as taxpayers value most, density or community. New England small town character and history or inward looking tall buildings with no porches, no balconies, no intermediate shared public private spaces and barely any grass, shrubbery, shrubbery or trees. We need design standards that we want to live with that will allow the business districts, BG and BL to look as if they belong here in this college town. With good strong design standards, it is possible to create buildings that work and also contribute to our tax base. As Cinder Jones knows and is working hard to create in the Mill District, we need art, culture, theater, music, poetry, painting, and experiences downtown, a place where town and gown can meet, where people from all groups and neighborhoods in town can get together and create the community that we call Amherst. Thank you. Darcy, you need to raise your hand. Hey, I'm gonna cover the last three bullets on slide two. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, okay, uh, several counselors, including the three co-sponsors of this legislation, support amending the zoning bylaw to include inclusionary zoning that would require developers to make a portion of the housing units in their project affordable to low and moderate income households. That approach to affordable housing is the most effective means of increasing the number of affordable housing units and creates a wider variety of affordable levels within a development and it's a proposal that it has been put forward by the planning department since at least 2018. So uh, we want to have time to get that um, out there. Common concern about inclusionary zoning is that it may slow the pace of development, acting as a disincentive for private developers who may be considering investing in a community. But studies have shown that inclusionary zoning does not in fact slow the pace of private development in a community and residential development rates are driven much more by the strength of local, the local housing market and broader economic and market trends. Um, next bullet. Uh, in canvassing District 5 during my campaign in 2018, I found nearly universal disappointment in the planning board approval of the Spring Street building, whether with the height, setback, or some combination of those elements, and much disappointment generally with the tall buildings that had appeared downtown but parking was noted in particular as a problem. The fact that the new buildings in the core of downtown are not required to provide parking, even though the town provides parking permits at low cost for the residents of those buildings caused much concern. I support disincentivizing fossil fuel powered car ownership and incentivizing biking and car sharing. But if we do nothing to support those goals, we, we do continue to need parking. Many drivers are transitioning to electric vehicles, which don't add to our emissions. We will need parking for those EVs as well as EV charging infrastructure for residents of those buildings. Plus, if the downtown doesn't provide the basic goods and services required in a densified neighborhood, such as a grocery store that was mentioned before, um, cars will continue to be needed. We still need to go to the mall to get the hardware, you know, the hammer, the, the, uh, the uh, head of lettuce, whatever. One way to disincentivize driving is to charge much more for our parking permits. Mm -hmm. That would bring in more revenue for the town if residents still need parking. Um, and this is uh, something that is currently being proposed. Though the new buildings have some green features, we will we want to make sure new construction is following the most updated recommendations for green buildings. And as I've repeatedly mentioned, the town staff will be presenting a climate action adaptation and resilience plan at the beginning of May. And it will include a number of recommendations regarding the building sector, some of which are recommended to be implemented in the near term, since we have an emissions reduction goal of 25% by 2025. It'll be important for the planning board and CRC to make those recommendations under take those recommendations under consideration for zoning amendments during this temporary pause. Um, so Kathy mentioned uh, what an overwhelming response we've had to uh, this moratorium petition. Uh, we got, um, I think, 238 signatures. 
Um, so I am prepared to read the motion now. Is that good, Lynn? Um, I want you to read the motion that is in red on the um, sheet. It's the one that we submitted? We had to make some changes to the one that you submitted because there were some inaccuracies in what it was what was stated. Oh, who's got this? Can, can I just ask, we had one more slide, Darcy, on what our the proposed zoning change would be. Can we just assume that every, the counselors have read it? Why, why don't we just, do we want to take a quick look at that? I'm sorry, I, I, I intended to say go to slide. No, I, it, it's fine with me to move on if everyone has read it, but I don't know whether the public knows what's in it. It's the next slide, Athena. I mean, I can do this, Darcy, if you want me to. Um, Go ahead. Okay, so it is a temporary moratorium. It's, as people have mentioned, some were asking that it be longer. We're thinking of it, it's hitting the pause button. It's not ending development for six month moratorium on new permits for buildings with three or more units in downtown, which is BG district, limited district BL, and the adjacent general resident RG districts. Note that this does not mean that it would make any stop on a single family home, a duplex, adding a, a, an accessory developing unit in your backyard. It would allow time to act, develop, and implement provisions regarding mixed use building definition, inclusionary zoning, design standards for streetscapes, revisit the parking overlay district provisions downtown, and potential climate action criteria for new construction. We included in the proposed uh, moratorium uh, was that the temporary delay could be extended for 90 days. That's the summary of what's in the longer text. Okay. I'm going to ask you to take that down and then let me just explain the following. There are two parts to this agenda. The first is the proposed bylaw that was originally submitted by three councils. Okay, and I'm going to read a motion that in part incorporates what the three counselors wanted, but we had to make amendments because actually there was some inaccuracy. Okay, and that motion is now on the screen. So somebody can make that motion. Um, Lynn, could I just ask a question? Yes. The, the um, petition of the residents. Yes. Um, if you'll allow me to finish, I would be glad to explain what will happen. Okay. Next. Thank you. Regarding, a po regarding the petition by the residents, the town attorney has advised that this is a non-discretionary action. It is strictly an administrative function. Therefore, I am noting in the minutes receipt of the petition and 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 am administratingly referring it to the planning board, CRC, and eventually GOL. So if counselors would like to discuss the initial proposal, they can certainly go ahead and do that with this motion, which will be put on the table. But in fact, the petition is automatically referred. What are the... Uh timelines though for the resident petition because that is in the the other motion but if the other if the pe resident petition was automatically referred how do we know what the timeline is we will not know what the timeline is until the planning board meets and sets their hearing that's at the discretion of the planning board can i say point of order yes there are state laws that require the hearing as of today's date to be held within 65 days, um, both the planning board and the CRC hearing to be held within 65 days and the town council to vote within 90 days of the CRC's hearing. Thank you. So uh, would one of the petitioners like to make the motion on the screen? I will read it. Um, can you make it bigger? It is just so small. 
I can't. I'm having real trouble reading it. You you have control on your Zoom. Oh. Is there any reason why we can't combine the referrals of this and the resident petition? Point of order. Yes. I'm sorry, I, and I really didn't mean to interrupt you, Darcy. I'm very sorry. I really just don't understand, based on what you just said, Lynn, about the citizen petition, why on earth would we move this one when we have the citizen petition, which yes is an administrative duty but we still have to vote to do it and so that's why we have one kind of motion and i realize we might need to match up parts from the two different motions but i have no idea why we would move the motion by the three councillors in addition to the motion by the petitioners i'm really confused Alyssa, i appreciate your question this was originally the counselors, three counselors originally submitted their request and it included the temporary zoning bylaw. In addition to that, 20, 230 to 40 or 50 residents have signed a separate petition. That separate petition has to be referred. It doesn't matter, frankly, if the council votes to refer it or not. If the council would like to vote on whether they want to refer the same wording and the same additional um, petition from the three councillors, this is your opportunity to vote on it. But, but the dates are different in the two motions. One is based on mass general law and the one by the petitioner but sorry, it's a wrong use of petitioners. The one by the three counselors is using an earlier date than the one that's required by law. These, these were the dates that those counselors requested I put in here. The, um, that's just an outside date uh, for when it would need to be held. No, it's an inside date that April is too soon of a deadline based on mass general law. No, Mass General Law just says it has to be within, what, 60 days. So you're putting on an additional, okay, now we're in deliberation, I'm sorry. Christine Brestrup has her hand up. I wondered how you came up with the date or who came up with the date of April 21st, 2021. How was that date arrived at? It was, through, it was 30 days. by the three petitioners by the three counselors. So that was part of the original um, proposal by the three counselors, is that right? It was a, a motion that the three counselors advanced to you today with that date. That's um, kind of soon. It, it, we, it can be done, I believe, but um, it is rather soon. I, we we put it in there because we thought the actual act of having a public hearing would not require that much preparation uh, compared to, for example, making the written recommendation. Mortar, are are we in debate on something that hasn't been moved yet, or are we still? That's the into issue. a motion somebody to make this motion and then if somebody wants to amend it they can um okay i'll read the motion um i i guess i um and if either of the other counselors wants to amend <laughs> you can do so uh per mgl chapter 40a section 5 and charter section 9.8 g i move to submit the proposed temporary building moratorium zoning bylaw sponsored by counselors dumont pam and shane to the planning board and to the community resources committee for a joint hearing held no later than april 21st 2021 and for a written recommendation along with an explanation as to whether the proposed bylaw is consistent with the master plan 
from the planning board to the town council no later than 21 days after the joint hearing and further to direct the community resources committee to comment on voter recommendation and to submit all materials to the governance organization and legislation committee for review of clarity consistency and actionability in time for the town council to act within 60 days of the hearing is there a second I second. Thank no you. shame. Now there's a motion on the floor. Alyssa. Rather than trying to mess around with this based on what I was trying to get across in the point of order when I really was just truly confused, I believe this is an if close to being illegal motion because mass general law gives a certain period of time. I have no idea why we imagine that we can make that time period shorter just because we feel like it in terms of when the hearing should be held. So rather than altering this motion, it should one be defeated. And the other reason it should be defeated is because as we know, it's not automatic that when three counselors bring forward a zoning bylaw that we have to push it along but it is definitely automatic that we need to push it along for the uh, signed by 10 voters. And we obviously have way more than 10 registered voters. So as you point out, technically we don't even, if this hadn't come through as three counselors, if it had just come through as a 10 signature, we technically wouldn't need to vote. We always do just because then it's in our minutes really clearly that we know what we're doing. And it's always nice to have dates if we can, so that everyone knows to expect both on town council and in the public as to when these things are going to happen. So they don't have to go look up MGL 4840A section five, but I can't support a motion at all that uses dates that are a different time period than what mass general law requires for zoning. So there's a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Are there any other comments? Um, Lynn, I withdraw the motion. Does the person who has seconded the motion agree with that? Yes. Okay. Any other comments? And I said yes, that we go back to the motion that had the other dates in it, right? That's what we're... I guess. You want to make that motion, Kathy? The confusing thing to me, um, just as the second, I hadn't seen the first motion until the weekend and it kept having edits in it, Alyssa. You know, so I'm so trying to figure out what. So, Lynn, can I just ask, do we have to make a motion to refer or is it automatically referred? with all the dates that are in that. It's really a pleasure to council. It's automatically referred. Point of order. Yes. What has been automatically referred is what has been submitted by the registered voters and certified by that. The proposal by the three councilors has not been referred. Is that, that is correct? correct? Thank you. Is there any further question? So the minutes will show that the petition submitted by the residents were in fact referred to the Planning Board CRC and GOL on March 22nd, 2021. Alyssa. I have a request. I'm wondering, since we're just putting it in the minutes, because we're not trying to recraft a motion that might have changed, is we are actually, could we have in the minutes reflect those time periods? Because again, we're all going to be scrabbling to look and say, well, was it 60 days from and was it 21 days from? Can we just make sure that that's noted in the minutes as well, as opposed to when it gets closer to our actual town council meeting? And then my other question is, since we're talking about what's being automatically referred, what does the petition itself, which we didn't get until Saturday, say in terms of dates, just to make sure it doesn't say anything different about dates. I'm assuming, I'm glancing at it quickly here again. I only looked at the signatures before that it's just following Mass General Law and it's not asking for different dates. But since we've never put that up on the screen, maybe we could do that. 
Okay, would you please put up the petition language for one of the petitions, Athena? Sure, just one moment. Thank you. Kathy, I'm waiting for this first. Are there questions with regard to the petition? Kathy, do you have a question with regard to the petition? I was just going to answer Alyssa's question. The petition petitions this particular article. And so the understanding was that once 10 people had put their signatures on, it would go through this process. So there were no dates inserted into it. Um, we did explain to people that by signing this, they were asking for it to move to the next stage, but that was it. So literally that is the same language that you had in your packet as town councilors as the proposed amendment. Maybe Joe. I just wanna clarify on dates. Um, May 26th would be 45, six, 65 days from today. So the hearings will have to be held by May 26th. The next deadline is movable. It's 90 days from the date CRC holds the hearing that the council must vote. So you'll see that you can't name that date because you don't know when the hearing is. Darcy, you have a question? Just a procedural question. Um, what What is the language of the referral that is being made? with regard to the resident petition it is consistent with mass general law and it is to refer to the planning board the crc and the gol is it the same language that we have here it is the language that we have up here it is okay. consistent with the charter and with the general mass general law and so we'll be able to see that somewhere that Referral order. Yes, Len? Yes. Okay, that seems seems adequate. Um, I'd like to also just for the sake of answering questions, have the other slides that were prepared by at my request by the planning staff shown. And this is an answer to questions from counselors. Hi, uh, of Rob Moore here, building commissioner. Uh, if the uh, presentation can be brought up, I'll uh, get it started. And Christine Brestrup, planning director, will join me in a couple slides. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in response to a few very specific questions, uh, we have some information, addition, uh, clarification uh, about the proposed Article 16 temporary moratorium for uh, holding the issuance of building permits for six months uh, that are related to residential buildings of three or more dwelling units. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, as uh, mentioned by the sponsors of the, the language initially in the presentation earlier, uh, there are three zoning districts that uh, this proposed moratorium would apply to, the general business, the limited business, and the general residence. Uh, next slide, please. Shown here on the map uh, are those three districts. Uh, right in the center in red is the downtown, the business, uh, BG general business district. Uh, uh, right up against that in blue are several little uh, areas of the limited bus business district. Uh, you'll notice as you look far to the west on the map, uh, there's another section of that limited business zoning district. And then a little piece uh, as you work your way uh, over onto College Street at the intersection of Dickinson Street, 
uh, a little piece of BL uh, limited business there also. Uh, the remainder of the colored portion in the center of the map uh, is the general residence district, the third district that would be affected by the uh, proposed moratorium. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we were asked which projects uh, potentially would be affected by this uh, moratorium. Uh, currently, there are two that uh, I know everyone has heard about and we're aware of. Uh, one of them, 11 East Pleasant Street, uh, that's the site that includes the former pub restaurant owned by Archipelago Investments. Uh, proposed there will be a mixed use building, uh, 55 dwelling units, a mix of one to four units uh, with a first floor retail component and parking uh, on the interior of that level as well. Uh, this is a, an application that is not fully complete, but has begun uh, that we expect to and does not have a hearing date yet with the Planning Board for Site Plan Review or Special Permit, but we expect to have that established in the coming days. Uh, the second proposal that we're aware of would be uh, what uh, was uh, advertised recently as a demolition permit of 37 North Pleasant Street and 45 Boltwood Walk. At this time, there are no plans of the redevelopment that have been provided, uh, but we do understand that a, a similar type of development to 11 East Pleasant of a mixed use building first floor commercial with residential units above. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we were asked about uh, applications that are in process that would not be affected by uh, this proposed bylaw. In other words, this could be, uh, as an example, a apartment building in a district that is not subject to the moratorium. And in fact, we don't have any uh, proposals of that sort at this time. And I'll turn it over to Chris for the next slide. Good evening, I'm Chris Brestra, Planning Director. So we were also asked about other projects that um, would not be subject to the proposed bylaw. And for various reasons, these projects here um, would not be subject to the bylaw. Uh, 26 Spring Street is the building on Spring Street that's partially constructed. Um, that was fully permitted a while ago. It's going to contain 58 apartment, um, apartment units and it's under construction and we understand that construction will be resuming uh, soon. Um, the reason that's not subject to the proposed bylaw is because it is already fully permitted. Um, 462 Main Street is a project that was proposed by John Robleski. It's a mixed use building in the BN zoning district. It contains, it will contain 24 apartment units. Um, that is also fully permitted and under construction. And it is not subject to this moratorium because it's in the BN zoning district and also because it's already fully permitted. Um, there's another project at One University Drive South, um, which is a project that Barry Roberts has uh, gotten his land use permits for, but he hasn't yet gotten his building permit. Uh, that's in the PRP zoning district. So that would not be um, affected by this moratorium. And that's going to have 45 apartments and five of them are going to be affordable. Other projects that you may have heard about that wouldn't be affected would be um, University of Massachusetts is proposing what we've been calling the P3 projects, the public private partnership projects. They have one on Massachusetts Avenue, which I believe is going to contain 800 um, dwelling units along with some commercial and retail space. And they also have North Village, which they're proposing to re rebuild essentially. Um, so neither of those would be um, affected by the moratorium because they are both in the ED or educational zoning district. Then we have um, a building at 133 and 143 Southeast Street uh, known as Southeast Commons. It was proposed by Amir McChee and his wife. Um, it is in the BVC Business Village Center District. And so that would not be in, uh, impacted by this moratorium. And that's going to contain 57 apartment, uh, apartment units when it's completed. We also have um, 132 Northampton Road, which you uh, may remember from last year when it was permitted by the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's um, the Valley Community Development Project. Uh, it's going to contain 28 apartment units, all of them affordable. 
and it was granted a comprehensive permit in 2020, and we believe that that would not be um, subject to this moratorium. And the last project that I wanted to talk about is um, 408 Northampton Road, which was proposed by the Breckenridge Group Amherst MA LLC, and that is under construction now. It's in the PRP zoning district. Um, it is fully permitted. It has 88 apartments with 11 affordable units. Next slide, please. So we were asked to outline a timeline for this um, moratorium, and, and that's what we've attempted to do here. So the town council received the petition. I believe they received it on um, March 19th, which was Friday. Um, and the petition is now being referred to the planning board, the CRC, and the GOL um, within the 14 days <clears throat> from March 19th. Um, so the planning board will receive the referral and it will schedule a public hearing. The planning board must hold its public hearing within 65 days of referral. And I think Mandy Jo just um, uh, gave you a date for that, which I believe is May 26th. Um, and they, the planning board may hold its public hearing jointly with the CRC or the Community Resources Committee. Um, prior to the public hearing, the planning board will publish a notice of public hearing that has to be uh, published in the paper um, and sent to adjacent towns and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and I believe DHCD um, at least 14 days prior to the hearing. So then the planning board holds its public hearing and the planning board issues a report to town council with a recommendation on uh, whether to adopt or not adopt the um, proposed moratorium. And that has to be done within 21 days of the close of the public hearing. Um, after that 21 days or after receiving the report from the planning board, um, the town council may, may vote to adopt, amend or reject the proposed zoning amendment. And then um, town council excuse me, must vote within 90 days of the public hearing or else the planning board needs to hold its public hearing again. Um, and then we have some uh, Q and A's here at the end. Um, questions, next slide please. Questions that uh, we think that people have asked. Um, so is a mixed use building considered a residential building that would be affected by the proposed moratorium? And the answer is yes. Um, the reason we thought that was important is because people don't always think of a mixed use building as being a residential use, and it is. The second question is, if the proposed moratorium is adopted, can a building permit be issued before the moratorium has expired? And the answer to that is no. Um, the, the moratorium specifically um, would prevent a building permit from being issued. Um, the last question, though, is uh, something that we thought everybody should be aware of. If the proposed moratorium is adopted, can a site plan review approval or a special permit be issued before the moratorium has expired? And the answer to that is yes. So somebody who's already in the uh, permitting pipeline can, or even somebody who hasn't yet um, submitted an application can submit their application and go through the public hearing process and then receive um, site plan review approval or a special permit. The only thing they can't uh, receive is a um, building permit. Um, now this all uh, is premised on the fact that um, new zoning would not have gone into effect. So if new zoning has gone into effect, if we can um, hold a public hearing on some of the new zoning that we're, uh, that we're putting before the CRC, um, those new zoning um, amendments may affect um, anything that is submitted uh, in, in the interim anytime soon. So I think that's all I have to say about that, but you may have questions and um, Rob and I are ready and willing to answer your questions. Christine and Rob, first of all, thank you. Um, with short notice, you turned this around at my request. Uh, and it was based on questions I received from counselors. It is in your packet, or if it isn't, it will be. So you don't need to take notes. But Steve, let's go ahead with questions or comments. Yeah, so if this is answered somewhere else, my apologies. But when does 180 days start? Does that start? Because right now there's a de facto moratorium period because there has to be a public hearing. Once there's a public hearing, that basically creates a moratorium. 
until we vote otherwise. So does 180 days start at the time of the public hearing, the, fr the first time the hearing is, when does 180 days start? Because when I'm counting all those numbers there and I'm coming up with a number that could look like 180 days. So I'm actually wondering if we're talking about a one year, if we're talking about a one year moratorium minimum. Christine. Rob, Rob Mora may be able to answer this um, better than I can. Yes, uh, the 180 days will start from the date the council votes if they were to adopt the uh, the moratorium. The last step of the outline, the, the timeline that was just outlined. So if I may, so then everyone should be clear that we're talking about a much longer than 180 day moratorium because of the de facto moratorium already. Rob, you wanna comment on that please? Just to clarify that the, um, the moratorium would have an effect the date of the, uh, the date when the public hearing for the planning board hearing is uh, advertised. So it hasn't, wouldn't have started yet at this referral stage, but coming soon, there'd be a date soon where that moratorium would have effect, but not counted towards the 180 days yet. So the date that they publicize is the date that the basically anything that is filed for application after that would be subject to the moratorium if it passes. Correct. Thank you. Trying to make sure I remember everything the attorney told us. Um, Steve, does that answer your questions? Okay, Dorothy. So um, my questions are really simple ones. Um, May 12th, would be the day that you would have to advertise the hearing. That is uh, a while from now. I, it seems to me that um, many buildings could get under the wire before that date. Um, is that a possibility? Rob, Chris? Um. Well, so <laughs> we're competing with each other here. Um, nothing has, well, so we've received a very uh, unfinished um, application for 11 East Pleasant. Um, when that application is finally submitted and it's complete, the date that um, we're assuming that there would be a public hearing would be sometime in early May. Um, it's the planning board meets twice a month normally um, it's unlikely that the planning board would approve such a large project in one hearing. So it's more than likely that they would have a, a hearing in early May. And depending on how the um, applicant is, is working, um, they could have another hearing in late May or they could wait until early June. We really don't know. Um, once the planning board opens its public hearing on a project, it can carry on for for months, depending on whether the planning board has all the information it needs. So I don't believe that the two permits that that project needs, which is site plan review and a special permit, would be um, obtained by um, the date of the public hearing for the moratorium, but um, or by May 12th. So I don't know, maybe Rob can <laughs> explain it a little bit better. Rob is shaking his head. Uh, yeah, I don't. Nothing else I can add to that. Andy, Joe, you had your hand up. Did you want to comment? Um, no, I decided not to. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Stanley Ballmill. So I, I have a question, but before that, um, I have a kind of commenty question. <laughs> And so I'm trying to understand this moratorium because I think all the goals that are listed in it are things that we are all discussing and talking and we all have 
in the council agree that these are the goals we are interested in, affordable housing, solving the parking problem, uh, design and walkability, economic vitality. And my question is, I'm trying to understand the reasoning and the research that, suge that suggests that this moratorium will actually lead to those stated goals. For example, uh, we're doing the moratorium so we can talk about how to put the inclusionary zoning so that we can then expect the developers to build with affordable housing. And there's a big assumption there that when we do put in, we stop, stall the businesses, the developers who've got the funding right now for whatever proposals, they have a plan. And we're saying, stop that. And because we are gonna create this proposal now so that you have to put in the inclusionary zoning. We have not included, I'm assuming that none of you have included the developers and the people concerned in this process. So we have no idea what they're thinking, where they are on this process, is it feasible for them? The research I have studied is that inclusionary zoning only works under certain conditions. And so if you're starting with the assumption that if we put this and they will do it, I'm not sure that's, it could backfire, which means that they don't build at all, they go and build in Hadley. And so we're not left with any housing that is going to meet our housing demand. That's one point. The second point is that we could be actually using this time, and we, we have been discussing a, com, you know, a community engagement plan, a very elaborate plan that was created, which would bring all the people, all the stakeholders to the table which would include developers, which would include students, it would include pe diversity, people of color, it would include residents, so that we can talk about what is possible. And I had already started these, these conversations, for example, with Cinda Jones, I said, you were interested in supporting affordable housing, how can you support this? And she brought out this box of files that she's been collecting to build starter home communities. And she wants to do that. She wants to engage our local builders and the bankers to create starter homes. And the message we're sending out instead to people like her and Barry Roberts who helped revitalize our Amos Cinema and, and Amherst Works and wants to do this, we're saying, no, we, we, don't want, we want to do it this way. We don't want to include you because you are only doing work for business, for profits. Morning. Yeah, is it over? Time up? Okay, so my question was then, is this going to lead to the, and what, I, what is the research, what is the reasoning to get there? And, and the question also that was one, and the second question is, can the petitioners withdraw based on further conversation. Can they withdraw this? Can we talk of another way which includes people? Is that a possibility? Um, either Chris or Rob on the question of can they withdraw? I, I believe the answer is no. Paul? I think the answer is no. Once you have a petition and it's been signed by all mm -hmm. those people, uh, it's practically impossible. Mm -hmm. What you could do is go around to each of those people and ask them to agree to withdraw. And if they did agree to withdraw and sign something saying that, then I believe you could, it, it could be withdrawn. But mm -hmm. practically speaking, it's really not possible. Paul, well, you have your hand up. So we did ask that question of the town attorney and he said, no, you can't. Once it's submitted, it's submitted because some people may have relay, relied on someone else signing it and that otherwise they may have signed it. So in all practical, for all, just agree with Chris, for all practical purposes, the town council must consider this proposal. Thank you. Um, the other question that Shalini asked, I think is much more, um, might require a much more complicated thing. And I'm not sure we're gonna get into that tonight, Alyssa.
Okay, three minutes. So really helpful slides. Thank you so much staff and everybody for pulling those together. Really important context for all of us to understand. It's super frustrating that my three colleagues have had over a week to build public support in the press and elsewhere for their point of view. And that mm -hmm. with the rest of us town councilors started receiving emails expressing that point of view before we even knew this idea existed. Mm -hmm. And the remaining 10 of us have had zero opportunity until tonight to present our concerns with the impact of such a moratorium and also to address the types of complaints people have expressed in those emails that they hope the moratorium is going to address. For example, we do have inclusionary zoning. We have Article 15 as passed by representative town meeting. Now, it's not been particularly effective, but please stop acting as though we don't have inclusionary zoning. We have some, we just need to fix it. And that's one of the things we know we've been struggling with. The municipal parking district was not created by some other. It was created by representative town meeting. And the reason you have parking permits issued to people who live in that municipal parking district is because staff took it upon themselves to issue those. That was never the intent of the keepers of the public way. We said, really, you're gonna have leases that say you can't have a car? And the developer said, yes, people will love that. And we said, okay, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Design standards, representative town meeting, turned them down twice. We, the town council have done basically nothing i know mandy joe's gonna love this but basically nothing with zoning since we were elected other than the really important temporary zoning we did with outdoor dining support so all the things we said when we were running for town council back in 2018 including a moratorium including additional affordable housing have not in fact changed any zoning to make any of those things happen so i'm truly frustrated by the people who've written to us and expressed tonight in public comment, well, it'll be good to extend this past that campaign so that we can hold these town councilors to account for what they've done. We've done nothing for zoning. And in fact, the buildings that a number of people, not everybody, but a number of people are unhappy with were created far before this town council came into existence. And there was nothing that we could do to fix those buildings, although it's true, a moratorium, will stop another building like that. Finally, because I only have 28 seconds left, even though other people have had a week to talk about this in public with everyone, is that it's important that for those town councilors who are most of you who never served in representative town meeting and therefore never dealt with zoning proposals to understand the part about the two year limit if something's acted on unfavorably. I wonder if Chris or Rob could put that in context for us or maybe Paul's already talked to the town attorney about it because when a zoning bylaw is very specific like this and it says three districts, if the temporary zoning bylaw, I know I'm over time, goes is fails at the town council level so it goes through its whole process and then it's voted down by the town council there's a two-year limit as steve could obviously speak to but how specific is that limit to a moratorium versus a moratorium in these particular districts oh well, rob chris uh, yes yeah, so we, we did actually have that discussion with the town attorney recently and just as an example, if a moratorium were, were to, this moratorium were to fail and be re-proposed again, eliminating, say, the RG district from that proposal, that could be viewed as different enough to proceed, just as an example. So it could happen that, in that way. Thank you. Steve Schreiber. So I was actually going to ask a nerdy question, but Alyssa, uh, Councilor Brewer, that's me down my list of, of things that I want to say. So zoning is always changing. So the fact that we're in the middle of zoning changes right now, that's how communities, the, the zoning bylaw is not written in stone. It should be forever changing. There was a, when we had town meeting, the zoning changed all the time. So the fact that there's zoning underway now is absolutely no reason for a moratorium. Uh, the other thing I want to say is just perception versus reality. So I can't tell you how many times tonight we've heard that the new buildings downtown have replaced businesses. Kendrick Place was built on a vacant lot. Boltwood Place was built on a service yard. Um, it's true that Wendy's Pleasant was built on the carriage shops. If you look at the list of the building code problems with the carriage shops, you probably, you know, that's that was a, a substandard building. 
And yes, it's true that the buildings behind Brook Cousins Market is those have those have closed. But uh, Kendrick Place and Boldwood Place were built on vacant lots. The other thing is a little bit of science. So I can't tell you how many times I've heard that the new buildings have cast shadows on Kendrick Place. Did you know that the new buildings are on the east side of the Kendrick Place? And basically the only time that the sun will ever possibly cast a shadow on Kendrick Place is on sunrise this time of year. And it doesn't even do that because there's a hill behind them and it's the hills that cast a shadow. So you have the, 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 the petitioners have a perception that shadows are being cast on the sidewalks and shadows are being cast on the park. They're not, that is your perception, that is false. Are there any other comments before we move on to the next agenda item? All right, thank you. We are now going to go back to presentation items. Um, I want to point out that each of these items had in your folder or in your packet a memo. And so I'm not going to ask for a presentation on that memo. Instead, I'm going to ask counselors if they have any questions. And the first item is the major capital projects update. I see no questions. Okay, then we're going to go on to the update on the review of the Jones Library options. That's a memo from me. And it was also accompanied by the beginning of, I don't know, 40 plus pages of answers to questions that have been asked. Are there any comments or questions at this time? Darcy, please use the raised hand function on case I'm not looking at I have trouble going back and forth. Um, uh, yeah, I just have a comment that um, there were a number of questions that I asked and they were all listed together on one page um, and with a statement that, that they were all answered in the narrative and they weren't. So I, I guess I just need to resend them or something. Okay, if you would, please, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on the Jones Library options? Then the next one was on the update on funds appropriated to address systemic racism. Are there questions on that? Andy. Sorry to take a moment to unmute. Um, it's really a question maybe for Paul, but um, he talked about three alternatives that for the remaining funds that are available. And all of them seem like they are the beginning of a project that would involve um, significant more funds to complete. And uh, I was wondering if any analysis has been done on what the funding needs are, would, might be to complete those processes, uh, whether they, um, how they could be funded has been considered and whether that should be a factor in making a determination as to what are appropriate uses for the remaining balance of the currently appropriated funds? Paul, huh? please go ahead. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's a really good question, Andy. You know, we're looking at the options, what we need for next year as part of our budget process. And, you know, this could serve as the seed money that moves into the needs for the next fiscal year. 
Um, I, I definitely want to support the work of the core equity team. I think that's very important work and there's a lot of different uh, directions we can go in that. You'll see that in the budget presentation when I deliver it on May 1st. Um, you know, the, the, um, the research that needs to be done, um, I think that that will grow out of the work that is being done by the Community Safety Working Group, which we will know by the end of April where, where they are, um, what gaps of research they'll have because they have a consultant working on research right now. The reparations question is a bigger question, um, more of a policy question that I'd look for guidance from the council on. If you, if the council wants to start moving in the reparations, I think that's, uh, I think that's a pretty significant step and I would rather have the council saying, yes, we wanna be moving in that direction um, if, if you think that that's the wisest place to go. I do want to point out that that is not an agenda item tonight, so we are not going to get into that debate. If somebody would like it to be an agenda item in the future, when we get to future agenda items, please make that request. Dorothy Pam, you have your hand up. Dorothy, we can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Going back to the uh, building project update, I have it on my, my other computer. Um, I hadn't really studied it beforehand. I was very busy with other things. I'm looking at it and I, I'm i confused. You haven't said where, you said the fire, new to fire department would be built on the DPW property. Is yeah. that both of them will be on the same property or is the DPW? You're going out for proposals and I don't know where it's going to be. I think I missed something. Okay. Dorothy, can we just hold off a minute? Alyssa, is your question with regard to the um, update on the funds appropriated to address systemic racism? Yes. Okay, please, please proceed. Dorothy, we'll come back to it. So thank you. So um, this is a little confusing to me because I have, I believe we were just directed that this isn't on the agenda tonight to make any sort of vote associated with moving forward on a path of reparations and that that would have to be discussed under future agenda items. I have asked this to be on future agenda items, although in the past and it has now appeared tonight, which I really appreciate. So I'm not sure what different way I need to ask it or if it's that you're looking for a specific proposal. I think maybe this is a chicken egg situation where we've been waiting, those of us who have been working on trying to implement the resolution that we passed, that we all passed in December, is to try and figure out what the town manager can find out from legal counsel, as he's indicated, he already got some information from and is still working on information from in terms of how the financing would actually work, the, the techno geek type stuff in terms of how it would actually work. But then there's also, as he just asked for tonight, the sort of direction from town council. And so I'm not sure other than the agenda item tonight, what more you want from me <laughs> to be able to express to, to get the town council to say, yes, we'd like to actually live up to the resolution that we passed in December and start working on some specific things. And it may or may not be that individual counselors feel like they wanna talk about that particular $5,000 request, but that's why we were thinking more about a process associated with, the, with what the money might look like. So I appreciate it's all gotten very complicated because we don't formally set aside $80,000 we have the core equity team doing some terrific work. We have community safety working group doing amazing work with a consultant that's going to help find some gaps. We have the League of Women Voters asking for some data that in my mind, because I haven't seen anything more specific yet, is data that we could simply be gathering on forms we already have and in fact should have been doing all along because we had a police stops committee years ago that said we were going to collect that data. So I don't know why we're not already collecting the data. but two of those things seem like very necessary operational budget things that should be going forward. And I don't think $12,000 is gonna go very far toward those things. 
And I think that's why you normally shift money over the course of a year is for new things like that. I think that the separate $5,000 is for a particular time sensitive thing. It is not for like all of reparations, a huge program like Evanston is about to undertake. It is for a portion of what might potentially be a program. And so I'm not sure how we communicate effectively to the town council, to the town manager that yes, to be very blunt, yes, I want that money to be spent that way. So what's the way of making that happen? My apologies, my apologies if I did not see your request as wanting to discuss the larger issue of reparations, okay? I saw it as wanting to discuss whether or not the request for 5,000 could be honored and should be honored, okay? I don't think there's an apology necessary at all. I think it was, it's both is, is, the, is the confusion because we didn't know what the process would look like. So I think it's that we're still trying to figure this all out as we go along. But if we're saying that the town manager needs more direction to be able to feel like he needs to pursue it further, how is it that I get the rest of the town council to provide that direction? Paul, would you like to comment? Yeah, so, I mean, just a few minutes ago, the, uh, the city of Evanston just approved their reparations uh, um, decision. They made their reparations decisions. You know, there's been articles in the paper about the work that they're doing. So that their council just voted that, the first count, the first uh, community in the, in the country to do that. Um, it's groundbreaking. And, um, you know, I think that's a, it's a significant step in a, in a certain direction. And if the council says we want to move into the reparations thing, I think the council needs to say that. Um, if you're, if the council saying we're not quite there yet um, to start devoting money to this, we we need to we need to do other work. Um, then the council uh, look for guidance from the council on that. Um, but I think that the moving into the reparations area, which is you know I think a lot of us have educated ourselves and feel like that that might be a very wise direction to go in. But I do think it's a significant policy decision that the town manager shouldn't be doing on his own, but the council should be saying, yes, we want to move in that direction. Galani. Oh, okay. So I, what I'm hearing is that we, not hearing, we all did sign a resolution um, for anti-racism, making an anti-racism for reparations for Black people. But it also, what I'm sensing, and I may be wrong, is that not everyone in council agrees what that looks like. And so is that a discussion we need to have? Or, and I think I'm seeing this as two separate things. And then I want to also acknowledge the work that's already been done by, um, reparations for AMAS group, they're doing some very important work that is needed, that is so essential. And having um, Alderman Simmons come and lead the, um, the Black community and lead the sessions with them and then to have other forums, that's very important work that someone had to do and they are doing that. And I feel they should be paid for that. And the other, the third aspect is of measurement, which is also something we need to do as a town. So these are all very important issues. And um, I don't know, do we need to take a vote on that? Or what do we need to do, as Alyssa was saying, to, to make some decision and to give clarity to Paul as well about, you know, where do we, how do we assign? Because all, yeah, how do we assign this? money. Is there a motion that someone from the council would like to make with regard to that specific request? Mandy Jo. So I guess one of my questions is, I don't know whether the council has the right to assign that money or vote on where that money goes. I would say we passed a budget, it's now in Paul's hands to spend the money. Um, so I, I think we might need clarification on whose authority it is for the rest of that 12,000 to decide how that 12,000 is spent because 
I don't know whether it's the council's authority to make that decision versus what I read Paul's memo as was he's seeking some guidance, but that guidance I didn't think was was as a council as a whole, I think he just wanted to hear from us as counselors, but maybe I interpreted things wrong. Alicia? While I certainly appreciate that the division of power is far different than it used to be, we are policy making body. He has asked for policy direction. I think that what individual counselors want is not relevant at all even if i think it's the best idea in the world if i can't convince a majority of town councilors it's a good policy direction then i fail and so if i just called paul up and said i want you to spend the money this way i don't think that would be appropriate and so i didn't think his memo was asking for that i again you know i don't want to belabor the whole issue of process but we're still just all trying to figure this out and so I do believe that we, if he had not created the community safety working group, if we had not come up with that plan together, he didn't need us to give him thoughts on that, but he asked us for that because we're elected officials and he wanted to know policy guidance from us. And he eventually came up with the community safety working group he came up with. He didn't ask us before doing the core equity work because he knew it was important work to do. He sounds like to me, he's not sure he's getting adequate direction that of this little amount of money left, what, assuming it's legal to do, he should be doing with it or if he should just be leaving it aside for a future budget. I'm saying, if he's saying he doesn't have to use up all the money a certain way and I'm not waiting until his evaluation to complain about how he spent the money, that we should be able to give some policy direction saying yes we think this is a good direction to go and see if you can make it work out legally or no we think this is a terrible idea and even though we passed that resolution we've literally done nothing since then and don't intend to do anything until we have some other budget conversation that's the angelus uh, I'm going to take a risk here. Um, in Michelle's um, speaking, Michelle Miller's speaking, um, in public comment, she talked about not wanting to be in competition with uh, two other uh, projects, one of them being the Core Equity and the other being the League of Women Voters. We have not, as a council, beyond creating a resolution had any real uh, substantive discussions about reparations. We haven't looked at what they could look like um, legally, uh, uh, creatively. We have not done that. Uh, and that, so for me, I feel like, I feel comfortable with Paul taking, you're taking the $12,000 that's left and making a decision about how you're going to use it. I would like to see it spent this year. Um, and I feel comfortable with whatever that decision is. That's me personally. What I don't want us though to do is to go, oh, okay, that's solved because it's not. We need to come together as a council and I'm not sure how to do this and have time in our meetings to really discuss the issues of reparations. Um, I want to, and we need to take that time. If we're going to address racism in any way in Amherst, then it's going to take time um, and, and commitment on our part. I have no idea what I, I have imaginings, but I have no direct idea about what uh, reparations should be, um, and and I would want I'd want us to begin a conversation, but I also want then the uh, community, the black community, to come together with us to to tell us what they want, and somewhere between maybe we'd be in the same place, but somewhere between. We could do. We could have a very creative solution to reparations in Amherst. I believe that, but I don't think that's going to happen with one decision right here. 
right now. And I do want to leave that with Paul. I'd like to just exercise my right as a counselor and build on what Pat has said. I, I think Paul needs to make the decision if Paul and can legally see a way to support the work of the reparations group as requested. And that reparations group will then come and share with the council what it's heard and help us through that think about this issue, then it's an investment well made. My hesitation all along has been, we didn't set out a competition for this money. Are there others that would like to have, you know, also applied for it? and to do something also similar. And that has been my hesitation all along. But if what Paul is looking for is, yes, it would be useful to have some support for a group of people who it has been talking in depth about reparations and that group can then come and share what they have heard with the council so that we can have a meaningful discussion, then I think that's a good investment. Melanie. Just very quickly, I do want to, see what I've heard is that they are creating a report, one from what they hear from the black community, what the, the black uh, residents community comes forward with in working with um, Alderman Simmons, they are going to bring a report forward to us. And secondly, I've also heard that they're creating a report on the measurement of the systemic gaps in the five different areas in our, in our town. So they will be bringing that forward. Are there other comments on this? Or Paul, do you have anything else? No, oh, this is helpful. Thank you. Okay. Dorothy. I really think that you need to question. Dorothy, you're not very Clear. We need you to. I, I think you've made a very good suggestion. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Now I'm feeling better. I want to ask my Can you hear me now? Vaguely. Okay. I agree with your analysis. I think it is good. And I think you shouldn't worry about if other groups push up and come forward. Sometimes initiative can be rewarded. That's it. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay. Dorothy, we can do one of two things. We can either wait till the town manager's report to ask questions about the building, which would be my preference because since we are going to do the CPA um, vote separately, we have a couple of staff people who have been waiting and I'd like to move that forward. Okay, so given that, what we're going to do is actually go to item E, financial orders, and we're going to go to item E3, which is to the FY22-07 Community Preservation Act project allocation. And Andy, you are the person who asked to take this out of the consent agenda, so I'm going to call on you first. Okay, the reason that I had uh, brought, uh, asked to take it out is not that I'm um, supporting or opposing any particular thing, but I wanted to point out a little bit of additional information um, about one of the proposals. And unfortunately, it's the only one that's left in for affordable housing, and that's the Amherst Community Connections. And what they're asking for is a third round of a program that has been uh, previously funded by town meetings in the past um, that uh, takes people who they're working with or apply through them and rents houses for rents housing for those individuals and places them in housing. Um, and uh, with the goal of trying to move the people from homelessness um, into 
a um, mode in their life where they can uh, productively find their own housing. That's what their hope is. And I had asked us several questions in the process going along. Um, and uh, one is whether this has been evaluated uh, since it's been in um, prior um, CPA budgets, whether there has been any real evaluation done or assessment of whether this has been a successful model or not, um, and um, what what our expectations as a uh, council should be about evaluating ongoing projects. And I also wanted to point out that it's a fairly big chunk of money, really. Um, it, it is, it's not small when you talk about, two, you know, over $225,000. And um, it's especially when you're considering that it's serving six people for three years. I mean, we had, uh, uh, for Northampton Road, uh, allocated $750,000 of housing money from CPA uh, to, you know, create 28 units for in for uh, an in perpetuity commitment. So we don't really know how many years, but I'm assuming at least 30. And Belchertown Road, we allocated $825,000 to um, get project off the ground um, for uh, creating 40 units of housing again that's a long-term housing. So um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that as we vote um, this recommendation, which was a, we did have the unanimous support of the, uh, of the CPA committee, that we understand the um, all of the factors that are behind this, um, as far as the amount of money involved, the amount that we're tying up, and not making, uh, not reserving for future housing, and uh, some of the logistical questions that are there. Um, and um, I think the last thing I'll just say is that when this was put forward, and I did ask Sarah Marshall about it, Sarah's uh, statement was. Yep, it's more expensive, but it's a different model. And that's what their conclusion was at the CPA committee. So I will leave it at that. I'm not pushing, but I wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity for the counselors to at least, my fellow counselors to at least be aware of the tensions there and the, the real cost of what we're talking about. I'm going to put a motion on the uh, four and then ask for a second and then we'll have for the comments. Um, uh, so we have already moved 8.4 for this. So the motion is in accordance with char charter section 5.6 having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on March 10th, 2021, a public forum held on March 22nd, 2021 and having been reviewed and recommended by the finance committee report of March 8th, 2021 to adopt council order FY20-07 and order appropriating the FY2022 Community Preservation Act budget as presented. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you. Are there further comments or questions? Mandy Jo. Yeah, I would just second um, the desire for more information on on this particular item that Andy uh, talked about. Um, I know a year ago or so I was asking the same thing in a committee meeting um, that uh, about just outcomes on it because it is a significant amount of money and I understand it's a different model. Um, and I think we need to be discussing whether that's a model we want to pursue or not, given the amount of money it is versus other models that seem to provide similar amounts of housing for less money. Are there other comments? Alyssa. Yes, along those lines, I mean, it is there is this tension, right, between the idea of do you solve 
transportation problems by getting everybody on the bus or do you just buy several people cars and so this is kind of an offshoot of analogous of that sort of situation and so it's providing real actual help to people but we always talk about how much our affordable units cost like in terms of town funds in terms of state funds etc and so it feels like this ought to be worked into that comparison as well and so i just wonder because it's community preservation act money which is a little different than some of our other money is what kinds of reporting is there beyond just when you come back for your next round of funding and you say that went really well and everybody says oh good here's some more money um just so that we could help like provide context to the community like we do different kinds of things for housing and this is one of them and these are some of those outcomes that that andy and mandy joe talked about so we have both anthony delaney here as well as um Sonia Aldridge. And Sarah Marshall still in the audience. Sarah Marshall is also still in the um, You want to speak to that, Anthony or Sonia? Uh, so to uh, to a variety of the points raised, um, you know, the this is uh, the third year, I think, that ACC has, has come back with this project. Um, it is true that uh, there are other ways that we could support affordable housing, but the, while the committee values building housing, there's also a need to uh, help the people that need some assistance uh, paying for their current rent. Uh, as far as accountability, while we're not uh, we're not doing on-site inspections or anything uh, every year. When they've come back, we have seen testimonials written and spoken at the public hearing. The project has, has the support of the Housing Trust. Um, and the actual invoicing for the uh, for the rental subsidies is approved by town staff. And it's not handed directly to ACC, but uh, to the landlords. Um, probably missed at least one or two points that people want a clarification on. And I would, if, if uh, Sean or Sonia or Sarah wants to pipe in here, I'd welcome that as well. Okay. Sonia or the hand that's up is the accounting department hand. I believe that's Sean. Yeah, sorry, Lynn, that's uh, Sean. Sonia hates when I use the um, accounting department account. So sorry, Sonia. Um, Anthony, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Andy might have mentioned this. It's a three-year, the allocation is for a three-year program, correct? Uh, that's correct. So it's, it, you know, it's roughly, I think, between 60 and 70,000 per year when you break it down that way. Um, this, I, and Andy, maybe, or Anthony, maybe you can also provide more information on this. I know CPA is looking at updating its reporting process. Um, we're going to be getting more regular reports. I don't know if they decided on whether it's once a year or twice a year. Um, but we can take this feedback, you know, that we're hearing to make sure that this is the type of information that we gather in those reports. Um, so when questions like this come up, we'll have something to point to. And Sarah Marshall, who's chair of CPA committee, has also joined us. Sarah, do you have a comment? Yes, I just wanted to confirm what Sean said. We did decide a while ago that we would institute annual reporting um, back to the committee. So we would be able to compile those reports. And I should say about the uh, Amherst Community Connections proposal, um, in the proposal, uh, they um, describe their success with the first rounds. It's true, we don't try to confirm that information in any way, um, but uh, they report that they have been quite successful and uh, because of their experience in the first two phases, um, they're able to expand the program. And I also wanted to remind the counselors that the amount requested for this particular project um, is a maximum, both in that um, you could vote a lower amount that funds either fewer uh, rental units or a shorter period of time. That's That was all in their budget, so that's an option. Um, and that they generally, or they certainly try to um, uh, 
get their clients to qualify for any kind of income that they don't don't already receive and that they put 25 percent of their income towards their housing um, but the budget that um, it was proposed assumes that nobody has any money to contribute to housing. So uh, it is quite likely that the true cost of the program will be less. Dorothy, you have your hand up. I want us to speak in support of that funding because uh, Housing First is a well-known program. It's been used by many places. I know from personal experience that providing stable housing keeps people from becoming worse, reduces costs in the long run, and prepares them to be ready to receive services and to take a positive role in their own life. So we don't have, we have to have many different tools to deal with the housing problems because they have many different causes. So I do support the program. I think we need it as part of our overall program for housing. Are there any other comments or questions from the council? motion on the floor is a motion that basically that in, allows us to approve the um financial order and that would include this proposal as well seeing no other questions i'm then going to move to the motion and again the motion is in accordance with charter section 5.6 having been published on the town bulletin board for the minimum of 10 days on March 10th, 2020, a, a public forum, forum held on March 22nd, 2021, having been reviewed and recommended by the Finance Committee report of March 8th, 2021, to adopt Council Order FY20-07, an order appropriating the FY 2022 Community Preservation Act budget as presented. Okay, I'm going to start with DeAngelis. Aye. Dumont. Darcy. Yes. Reesmer is a yes. Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Shalini Baumilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Unanimous 13 0 0 0. Um, I noticed that Sean has joined us and I want to go back to um, the questions that Dorothy had because it seems as if we went over the issue of the um, capital projects too fast. Dorothy, you were asking questions and I believe the question was, will DPW and fire be on the same site? Paul? No, they won't be. We're, we're moving, we're, these two projects are moving in tandem, um, but we need to find a site for the DPW, but we can start the work for the fire on the schematic sign because we know where that's going to go. Are there any other questions at this time on this issue? Okay, then I'm sorry to be skipping around like this. We are now moving to council agenda item 8B, which is the town council anti-racism training. And I'm going to ask Shalini and Pat who have proposed this training if they have comments at this time. I can go first, Pat. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we wanted to address some of um, some of the concerns that might have come up and to share with the council and um, to let you know that we heard you and there and uh, so we want to take a few minutes to just go over some of the points that may be of concern um so we were very careful in going through different 
looking at different options that were out there. And I just want to go over some of the points and then Pat can add to and share her perspective. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm fumbling over here. It's okay. Okay. So the first thing is I think the the the, the biggest criteria, the fundamental criteria we used for picking a curriculum was uh, something that would help us address systemic racism that was in the resolution that we passed that we committed to eradicating effects of systemically racist practices in the town government. So the curriculum that we selected, if you look at it, it really helps to over two days and it's a very concentrated curriculum where on day one, we talk about, it's always at the level of individual, cultural and institutional. So the idea is that day one helps to build off day two. And you know, that's, that is a concern. We understand it's a, it's a big commitment of two days, but this curriculum has been shaped by consultants who've been doing this work for 30 years. And, and it's really hard to, if you look at the curriculum and you try to remove any of the modules from it, it makes it less effective. And I know we're all committed that if we are going to put in the time and money, that we get a framework that really allows us to do our job better. And so that was the other concern. I mean, the consideration we had, we wanted to pick a curriculum that helps us do our job better, that empowers us to do our job better as leaders and not just personal growth, because I know we are doing that individually. People are reading different books and, and, and whatnot. But this is basically to empower us to look at policies from that perspective of um, through racism, given that we are not a very diverse town, I think that would be really helpful. The third criteria was to allow us to do it in a safe place. So we, uh, there are certain programs like we heard from Crossroads, they said that um, you can, for the, that you can do, you can have six counselors take this program at a time, which means we would be split up. And we wanted to make sure that we, and, and that too it would be with a public program. So here we're trying to do something that is only for us. That's what we heard is we want only counselors and Paul and Athena to be part of it. So we have that flexibility to work with it. Okay, I might be losing you all at this point, but I'm gonna <laughs> march on. The other thing is the timing because as uh, the consultants are really busy and given that we have the budget and all of that coming, we had the restraint of constraint of wanting to do this in the next coming two months. And with the consultant we found, she gave us many different dates as possibilities to work with us in the short run. And um, the last thing is, I think, yeah, the, yeah, okay, that's it for now. And we're happy to answer any other question. And Pat, go for it. I'm gonna uh, make a, a slightly more personal statement, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we can both answer any questions. Um, racism or white supremacy has been with us from the beginning of this nation, from the beginning of the Commonwealth, and from the beginning of the town of Amherst. Uh, it lives within us and it's among us. It's in the air we breathe uh, in, and in the ways we interact with each other. As a town council, especially at this time in history, we have the opportunity and the real necessity to learn to see how white supremacy silently drives each of us and, our li and limits our visions and ability to creatively govern and transform our community. We, as a predominantly white council, need to understand that our version of reality is not the reality. Um, to understand and pay attention, we need, we need to understand and pay attention to the reality as others, particularly mm. our BIPOC residents, experience it. We need to understand uh, the culture of the council and the way it supports and limits our ability to eradicate the effects of systemically racist practices in our government and in our town. This is substantial work, work which will take considerable time and commitment to accomplish. The Rethinking Racism workshop we are proposing to you will assist each of us individually and assist us as a public body 
to transform Amherst into an anti-racist community. Well, and that's all I have to say right now, but we looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight other trainings um, to find one that we felt would address us as a municipality, as a, a group of people working together. And we think that Rethinking Racism is the workshop we should begin with. Are there questions from the council or other comments at this time? Mandy Jo. So I, since I'm the one that asked for this to be on as a discussion item, I felt like I should say something. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate the conversations I've had with both Shalini and Pat over the last week um, to help me understand better what this particular training um, is meant to do because it's one thing that was not good in my understanding um, through all the different meetings we've briefly discussed this if we could call it a discussion at the council meetings. Um, so I appreciate that because it's better helped me understand why you have proposed a training that takes so much time. Mm. Um, and that has always been my primary concern um, is trying to create that healthy balance that is in our rules as one of our um, goals and values as a council, um, a healthy balance between work, council, and personal life. Um, I will say I am still concerned about how much time we are being asked to devote to this as when you look at it as compared to the time in a council meeting that we spend in a council meeting, we're going on four hours right now. Um, that's, mm. four times, you know, or four times that amount of time. Um, you know, and all, um, but you have, despite that concern, um, and I don't, I'm not sure I will ever relieve of that concern, and I want to say that, um, mm. you know, despite still having that concern, I am coming to a better understanding um, as to why such an amount of time um, will be valuable to the work we are doing as a full council. Um, and why it um, may be the best training out there. Although since I haven't done the research, I can't say that and I have to mm -hmm. rely on you guys. Um, you know, I, I, so I, I can't wholeheartedly endorse just this one, I, but, but I am saying I, I understand where it all is um, and, and I, I will, you know, I would love to have seen other options, but I understand why they're not there. Um, so I thank you for doing the research. Um, and, and I will work hard on coming to the training um, with an open mind in terms of how much time it's going to take away from family and personal life split. George. I think for me, um, the fact that there aren't any options and that we are basically being um, presented with this as a given is a problem. Um, apparently there are good reasons for it, but um, it certainly makes it difficult for me to enter into this wholeheartedly since I really haven't seen what the options are or had any choice in them. Um, it's basically being told this is it. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't like that. Sarah? So I'm a person that originally had you know, I think I've always talked about the fact that I want this job to be something that working people can do and moms and dads can do and that I have concerns about how much time we have to dedicate um, to everything town council. However, in looking at the training, I can see where a group would benefit greatly from spending that immersion of time together and in looking at what this course offers i think that it would be valuable and i think that you know i also keep talking about you know what we're going to hand down to the second town council and mm -hmm. even if most of you are still on that second town council um I'm thinking that we maybe think about some guidelines right now mm. um, and maybe we prioritize. I mean, racism is systemic. Racism is so, I mean, I don't, it's devastating. And 
I don't think that you can ever really know until you go through some kind of a, a discussion or a training how much it is systemic. And I think that it would be important for a town council. So maybe what we do is that this town council says, yes, we need to make priorities of what time we spend and what mm. things matter, but that this is something that really matters to Amherst Town Council. So we take the leap and we do it this time. And then we look at how we spend all of our time. And then we hand that down to the second council. So I've come around to seeing where the value in this particular training. Are there any other comments? Evan. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of piggyback on what Sarah said that I, I do think we really do need to think uh, seriously about, especially as we go into elections and we're trying to convince people to take mm -hmm. our away from us, um, that we really need to think carefully about what expectations we're setting um, for people. Uh, already we gave up a Saturday in February for the library. Uh, many of us are giving up this upcoming Saturday for the TSO public hearing on Pomeroy Village. Uh, this is looking at giving up not just a Saturday, but an entire weekend. Th this week, uh, Sunday and Friday are the only days I don't have council commitments um, because of that TSO public meeting on Saturday. That's a big ask for this position. This is not meant to be a part-time job. And yet mm. this week I'm actually spending more time on the council than I am on a job that pays my mm. bills. I think that that's something that we need to um, consider and, it, and we can justify why this is the right thing but I, I, I was really concerned when I first brought up this uh, concern that that concern was just outright dismissed um, and I think that we need to take that seriously we can't just dismiss mm -hmm. it by saying well racism is a, is a serious issue and we have to commit to this because we are sending a big message especially as we go into um, some really difficult issues when we're asking counselors to spend an entire weekend um, and for me, that weekend is actually going to be very tough because that week, uh, work-wise for me, I had actually planned on using that weekend to do a bunch of uh, grading, but now I can't necessarily uh, do that. Mm -hmm. So I just think we have to recognize that this is, the, there is a message that is being sent. And so I, I, I agree with George. I had always expected we'd be presented with some options mm -hmm. um, that had different commitments. I'm sure there were reasons why we weren't. Um, but that concern remains um, about what message we're sending and about the time commitment that we're actually asking of people. And, and I think we can't just dismiss that. Thank you. Darcy. Uh, I just wanted to express thanks to Shalini and Pat for putting this together. And I, uh, um, you know, I, I understand completely that this is a, the kind of immersive experience that we need and in order to get um in order to get it basically and um but i i do also want to emphasize that that um the best timing for it would be a in the winter and b uh like right after the new council takes office. Although I think it's great that we're doing it now. I think that as a as a regular mm -hmm. event, it should be, you know, like the February or March after the new council takes its office, you know, because it's not the greatest to be doing it, you know, on a beautiful April weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying mm -hmm better to do it in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. Steve. Yeah. Steve? Steve Schreiber. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm also feeling part of that group is like, this sounded like a great idea when we first were discussing it. And now it's spring. Um, it's, we're getting vaccinated and it's just, um, I just have, you know, just the timing just feels, you know, it's the end of the semester for me also. So I will do what the will of the group is. I'm in, I, I, I guess I really, 
I don't like going into things where I don't have an idea of what the actual outcome is. And I, I understand generally what the outcome is, but I don't have a clear idea, you know, why exactly we're doing this at the end of our terms, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is me just realizing that this is, you know, we're coming into April, it's starting to get really beautiful out. Um, I'm, I'm in the group that's gonna get vaccinated. So, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't mean that that doesn't have anything to do with the fact of what Pat was saying about this, fact that we have uh, systemic racism in the air that we breathe. But I guess I, I'll make a pitch for the next council, which is I think a workshop on, on urban design, on the built environment is critical. And there, these do exist for councilors because a lot of what we are struggling with has to do with the built environment. And quite frankly, the built environment is a product of this systemic racism that you're describing also. And I think that sort of looking at how, you know, sort of whether it's Amherst or not, but whether or not um, the way that we think of space is also related to all of this, I think that would be incredibly helpful. So if I'm still around in the next term, um, Maybe, maybe that's another thing that we can all engage in. But thank you again for lining this up. Shalini? Yeah, I just want to add one more thing to what George was saying, why um, we can definitely make a list of the choices if that's going to um, make make you feel better about what were the choices and then you can see why and we can explain why. But one of the reasons that we want all of us to do the same training, maybe a different, I mean, preferably at the same time because we have a shared experience, but we want to do the same training because it gives us the same language and the same framework. Because if you take a training on just implicit bias and somebody else takes a training, which is a part of that module of cultural or one is on hatred and compassion and one is on institutional, then we're all bringing different frameworks and we are not really able to shape the policies using that same framework and lens. And if it's helpful, we can definitely present the different options that were studied and the reasoning that just means we will do more work and we're happy to do it. I mean, we just have to put it down. It's just, it's already done. The work is done. We just have to uh, put it down in a document and share it. It will help you feel better about the choices. Marissa? At some point, um, as you actually, as several of you have remarked upon, I think we do just need to figure out who we're mm -hmm. holding responsible and it can't be the president. Okay, maybe it can be the vice mm -hmm. president. I don't know, Evan. Um, who <laughs> we're going to hold responsible for kind of this memo to future town council because a whole section needs to be about what's the value of being on an MMA policy committee? What's the value of going to annual meeting? What's the value to being part of a town councilors thing or a Western Massachusetts network thing, in addition to all the meetings you just have to go to, right? And how often should you hold district meetings? I think all those things are incredibly valuable for the next town council, even if the next town council is 98% the same people. And so I think this feeds into it. And so I hope we don't lose sight of that. And then Lynn decides, who's gonna keep track of those things so that that can be managed so that we're prepared to hand that information over to say, you really need, we wish we'd had you know, sooner and at these times of year to do different kinds of training. I think that's gonna be really valuable for the next group. Very timely, I'm talking to Evan tomorrow at some point and I think he just found his next assignment. Um, he's such a good writer anyway. Um, Without further comment, I'm going to, unless I've heard something differently, we're going ahead with this training. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Pat and, Sh and Shalini for all the work you've done to get us here. And uh, we will be signing a contract and moving forward. Pat, anything else you want to say? No, I was just wondering whether we were supposed to make a motion or anything because it was an action item. But basically, have heard lots of commitment and uh, the ex the additional explanation was excellent. Okay. So um, we'll be hearing more from people and how we link up that day.
Uh, we have one other item uh, on the action items. It's under the dis called Districting Advisory Board. Again, you have a memo in your packet along with a draft charge. I'm going to, Alyssa, is your hand up on this or something else? Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion and then uh, ask for a second and see if there's any questions. To refer the memo in the draft districting advisory board charge to the governance organization and legislation committee to review and, and recommend a charge timeline and appointment process to the council town council by April 12, 2021. Is there a second? I could second it. All right, go ahead. You can second and now So I'll second it, but then when you're ready, I'll speak to it. Please go ahead. Okay, so I know we're all exhausted. I just want to ask that we don't overthink this. I know it's not usually how I approach things, but we do this every 10 years just because this council's not done it before doesn't mean it hasn't been done before it was a very straightforward process last time 10 years ago and partly you know things are screwed up because delay and results but it's a very straightforward process we just did some cafs that the town clerk looked at and said yeah these people these are who we recommend select board appointed them done they had six meetings done they did the work and so Let's not make this too complicated. Um, use that old basis if we possibly can. Bearing in mind that, of course, while our districting does in fact affect the districting at, shall we say, higher levels, and the League of Women Voters has a meeting coming up about that on the 29th that I think we all got an email about, about how districting works at the state level, because it has to do with how they divide things here. But honestly, there's not a lot of choices when it comes right down to it, because you can't gerrymander. We know that here in Massachusetts. And so let's not overthink it. And I do have an objection to the composition as drafted. I don't think town councilors belong on this. It's not a political issue for us. And we all have way too many other commitments. And I would love to see it as another leadership opportunity for other people. In the past, when it had a somewhat different composition, it was when we had the 10 precincts, right? We had somebody from each precinct, basically, except precinct 10. And they were often town meeting members or former board of registrars. But they were also people who had other leadership skills that they either had brought with them or that they developed over the time that they were there. And I hate to see two of those seats sucked up by town councilors who already have a million things to do and don't need to develop their leadership that way. But other people could over a very short lived, time sensitive, you know, six meetings and done kind of thing. Mindy, go. Thank you. Um, I want to, I know it's coming to GOL and I sit on GOL, but I want to put out there that I object to two things that are in the charge. Um, and I think we need to add one thing to the charge. <clears throat> the charter itself in section, um, whatever the section is, five point uh, 7.4 states that the districts um, shall to the extent possible cluster together centers of common interest or neighborhoods considering but not limited to places where people live congregate recreate worship shop or learn that is not anywhere in this charge and because it's part of the charter and it must be followed it should be in this charge um, and I I must put forth my objection to the, in addition to the statutory requirements, the district advisory board should, and then the two bullet points under that. The first one is maintain current district, it says precinct, but it really needs to be district lines to the greatest extent possible so as to displace as few voters as possible. My objection to this one comes from the fact that we are a new form of government. Um, the charter commission, when it drew district lines, had to follow the precinct lines. Um, and could not draw its own districts um, in any way. And so if you look at the districts, they don't always actually cluster common centers of common interest or neighborhoods together. And so if we're going to put into a charge that we don't want to displace voters in terms of where they're voting, we're almost potentially um, hampering the ability of this body to follow the charter in clustering areas together. For example, it might be logical to have the district in North Amherst include Cushman and the North Amherst um, intersection at Pine and, and 
uh, North Pleasant Street, for example. And I'm just I'm making that up, but by putting this one bullet point in there, we are really hampering that committee's ability to look at that. Um, and then the second bullet point, distribute the student population across as many precincts as possible. Alyssa just said we can't gerrymander. Um, I read that as gerrymandering. I read that as harming the students in our town. If we substituted the word, uh, any other word that you can think of for the word student in here, if we took out student and put black or Asian or white or um, low income or elderly, we would know that that sentence seems wrong. And so to keep it in here, I have a real problem with that. So I'm going to argue and, and push for it, GOL, removing those two items. But I wanted to put that forth at the council level, too. And Joe, thank you for those comments. To be honest, I realize I attached the wrong version. But having said that, I drew this from uh, Elizabeth. This goes back to your comment. Uh, when this came up, I um, actually had contacted the town clerk. She sent me the most uh, the uh, report from 10 years ago. And I pretty much drew directly from that report for the charge. This now goes to GOL if we vote that way. And uh, we look forward to them returning with recommendations. There's nothing sacred about the way the charge is written. It was a, a process of wanting to get it moving. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, then the motion is strictly a referral motion. And um, Are there any, if no other comments, I'm going to begin with the voting and I'm starting with Darcy DeMont. Yes. Reese. Uh, Aye. Darcy Pan. Yes. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Matthew Shane. Yes. Lee Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Downey Balmill. Yes. Lisa Brewer. Aye. Patty Angelus. Aye. Thank you. That's 13 0 0 and no X. Uh, we are now on to <clears throat> the last part of our agenda, which is any, um, <coughs> excuse me, many reports. Uh, some of these are reports that are in your packet. And so I'm merely going to ask if there are additional questions regarding the report that was in the packet uh, for the Community Resources Committee. Um, can I just make a update? Please. Since, since the report was written, the agenda for CRC's meeting tomorrow changed. We will not be addressing accessory dwelling units. Instead, we will be addressing inclusionary zoning along with the two others that were in the report, which is um, mixed use building standards and uh, the BL overlay proposal. Okay. Thank you. Elementary school building, anything, Kathy? Uh, the main big news is that um, Anthony got the request for services into the federal register. It was approved by the granting authority. So now we wait for responses. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Finance Committee. Andy, anything else? No, I think that uh, Council is aware of the process that we're engaged in with getting information on Jones Library. We have one more meeting on the 30th of March on that subject. Mm -hmm. DOL, George? Nothing to add to the report. Any questions? Any questions for JCPC? Any questions for TSO? Then uh, we are going to move on to the town manager's report. And I'm going to ask if there's any questions on the town manager's report.
Dorothy. I would like to have a brief report from Paul on the town manager's report. He does it so well. Okay. Paul, a few highlights? Um, well, I try to make it as comprehensive in my, my writing so you don't have to listen to me because I know your meetings always go long. So I try to also I look at these things as being um, something that the public can read after the fact uh, so they can keep up to date on things in an easier way. Um, just a, an update the um, in terms of, of um, St. Patrick's Day and last weekend is relatively quiet throughout town, which is um, really good news in terms of um, large gatherings. We have not seen that. Um, and so last weekend, even though it was really warm, um, we didn't have many incidents at all, uh, a few noise complaints, but pretty low volume compared to what we had anticipated. Um, and that's, that's really how I have to add that's different than wasn't, there's nothing else I didn't put in my report. Okay. Any other, any questions? Then uh, I provided you with both the president's report and an update on the calendar. And let me just mention that on the update on the calendar, there is one item uh, that you should remove. And it was the item uh, under May 3rd, wayfinding signs. We already voted on that. And so it doesn't need to be there again. Are there any questions on either the president's report or the uh, future agenda items? Mandy Jo. The future agenda items had that there's a third meeting in June. Is that meeting actually happening on the last Monday in June? We left that on case we needed for the budget. Yeah, it didn't say tentative on the future agenda items and it had non-budget stuff on it. So I'm just trying to set a calendar here. Yep, I will add tentative to it and to the extent possible, uh, we can move the other items elsewhere. Um, the rank choice voting is, it's not going to make it by July. It's, it's, the house is in a mess, bluntly. Um, and uh, the housing CRC is up to maybe Joe and that committee. Okay. Any other questions on the future agenda items? Okay, then we get to counselor comments and other future agenda items. Darcy. Yeah, I just have three very short comments on basically um, uh, access of the public. Um, I was, I would like to actually make a request that at our next meeting we start showing um, the videos of, you know, people put people who make public comment on camera um, or give them the ability to do it. I don't know how that works. Um, I, I would, re, you know, there have been requests about that for quite a while and I, I don't really see why we can't do that. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, I um, would like to just request that the public comments on the temporary moratorium be available to the public somehow or other that they're they are archived and available on the website so that people can see them since they're part of the public record. Um, and thirdly, I when I came down to the town hall today to um, to go to the clerks. Um, I just was surprised <laughs> It shows that I haven't been there in a long time, but um, I tried to get in three different doors and before I really realized the place was locked. Um, so I just, I'm interested to know if that's what other towns are doing. I, you know, it seemed like everybody was in inside the building working. So I just wondered why, why the building would be locked. Mrs. Ackerman. Yeah, so the town hall has been closed to the public. We've been serving people either remotely or in person outside. If they come in, ask for an appointment, we meet with them independently. So if you had an appointment with the town clerk, she would have met you um, and met, met your needs that way. We are looking at reopening the building as we start to move into more people being vaccinated. 
uh, most of the people are, are working in town hall, uh, so it, it's an, you know actively in the building. We have uh, we are depopulated to a certain de-densified to a certain extent uh, based on the requirements by the um, by the health director. Uh, but now we've we've been we've been broadening that, and more and more people are back in the building. We're probably I mean everybody's on this floor. First floor is pretty full. Um, but we have people spread out throughout the buildings. We're utilizing conference rooms as office space. Um, so that's where we are. We, we are looking to open up, begin a gradual opening of the building um, in different ways and different in trying to help people serve, to serve people in a different way. Um, thank you. Yeah. Oh, Darcy, is there anything else? No, I just was thanking Paul and um, um, and but I would be interested to hear from you, Lynn, about the uh, the public comments. Yeah, I will make that request and Athena and I will work on it. Thank you. Oh, you mean the public comment regarding the showing the videos? Yeah, that we can work on that. Okay. Great. Uh, Kathy. Um, this is just um we, we took a vote on the North Commons parking lot, not parking lot, and there was an effort to go out and talk to the businesses. I had asked to try to get those materials a while ago so I could post them and get them out to the broad community. And I think we should be doing that in the future. I mean, we're, we're changing the way we're using a shared public resource downtown. And I bet a huge number of people don't know what we just did. I mean, what you know, we have the one tool is engaged Amherst. And if I know people said last time, don't do a survey on it, but it doesn't even show the pictures, you know, to how do we, you can't, finding it in a council packet would require you knowing that we're thinking of doing something. So I just would like in the future, if we're doing something fairly significant, that affects a resource that's used by lots of people, that we get the word out well in advance. So people are at least aware of what we're doing. Um, and I appreciate that we did walk around and talk to the businesses in the area, but then it was an overwhelming majority, don't do it. Um, you can't look at that any other way with 63%, but that wasn't enough to move things. I just think we need to have that as a practice so people feel like they are at least aware, even if their voice may or may not make a difference. Because I don't think most people knew. So hopefully we'll at least get a story in the Gazette um, to explain to people what we did. And I just, as Lynn, you know, I asked for it a few times and you said, don't put anything out till the new design is ready. Um, and so- You had the new design, you had it, but it was only at the beginning of it was only, and, and so I appreciate that there was a delay on it, but I just, what I'm saying as a practice, I think we should get it enough in advance of us making a decision. If we have to postpone the decision, still get the word out so people can see, see what it is we're um, talking about doing. That's my comment. I just want to compliment the town clerk's office. I had to make four visits there today as people just would show up handing me petitions and um, calling ahead. They would open the door. They were friendly. They were efficient. Then they would send me the email copies of the signatures. They would hand me the originals. Uh, they were really very good. Um, so I think that they're doing a fabulous job under the difficult situations of COVID and they should be, be appreciated. That's all. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so maybe a comment and a question. So this has been one of the busier email weeks that I can remember on the council, other than the time that we were talking about the polling places, but because zoning gets everyone's attention, uh, because zoning has to do with your property, your house, your street, you know, your downtown. So um, a lot of the zoning concerns were mixed up. So in other words, people thought the moratorium had to do with rezoning RG or rezoning BL or whatever. So um, I spent a lot of my time writing to people in district four saying, no, those are two separate issues. But I, I just wonder, and I know that the, our president who is 
typically responds to those. Is that, I'm not sure that there was a satisfactory response to those people who thought the moratorium had something to do with RG zoning in particular. That seemed to be the one that was the mixed up the most. There was so, no Yeah. Was so that, that might be just us on the ground trying to disassemble all of that. I, there was not a good response to that because there wasn't a response that I could come up with. And yeah. consult with uh, the chair of CRC to determine when those are coming up next. So I make sure those are in the response. I actually felt quite, quite unable to respond on that one. Chalini. Um, to me, it felt like when I was reading that, that, that information is being shared with people that we have either, we are ready to pass or remove, you know, that footnote, or it seemed like people had this impression that um, we are, changing the zoning, whereas what we're doing is having conversations about it, studying the impact and pros and cons. And so I think sharing that information with people, it seems like people are not very clear what is going on. And it's hard for people to follow because there's so many processes that so many boards and committees. So I understand people are confused, um, but I think that might be helpful to let people know yep. what's going on. And if I could ask um, the chair of CRC to let me know when different topics are coming up and we'll make sure people know that. Okay. Any other comments? Any other future agenda items? Seeing none, then I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 11.08.